I've been playing hardcore mode for a while now and recently I hit 2000 days in my hardcore world which is a huge milestone for me, which is why I'm making this video. Since I've reached this milestone, I've released a new world download on my Patreon, so check that out if you're interested. With that being said, enjoy this video which is a massive compilation of everything I've done in this world from days 1000 to 2000. I want to collect lots of totems in my hardcore world, thousands of them. These will allow me to cheat death forever. To do this, we will need an infinite totem farm. To get totems, we need to defeat a raid, meaning we need to find a pillager outpost. Arriving at the outpost, we need to find the pillager holding a banner. Killing him will give us the bad omen effect. Now, we need to find the village to start this raid. After defeating that raid, we got 5 totems and a bunch of other loot. That whole process took about 20 minutes. 5 totems is great, but I want a lot more. To do that, we're going to need two things. A bad omen farm and a raid farm. We'll do the bad omen farm first. This farm will be made using the pillager outpost. So to build this farm, we're going to need a bunch of grass blocks, glass, kelp and a few other things. And while we're at it, let's melt the sand into glass. Okay, that should be everything we need. Hold on, I just had an idea. Let's go collect some of the obsidian we got from removing the end island to set up a nether portal. And while we're at it, let's move our other portals to the nether roof until we build a nether hub. Arriving at the pillager outpost, let's set up a quick staging area, grab the blocks we need and start working on this farm. To start, let's go on top of the outpost and place a block of soul sand. This is the start of the elevator that the pillagers will use later. Next up, let's take the grass we collected and build a spawning platform. Following that, let's build a small platform that will come back to there. Now let's place some glass walls on either side of the soul sand, place some trap doors and then some signs to hold in the water. And now we build the elevator up and into the sky. When we get to about 115 blocks or so above the spawning platform, we build the killing area. Then we fill the elevator with water. Add a lot of kelp to make sure it's all source blocks. That way when we enter it at the bottom, it takes us all the way to the top. Lastly, we go back down to the bottom and use some glass panes to make an enclosure around the glass platform and summon an iron golem. This guy will get the pillager's attention. And finally, before we give this farm a test, let's remove the staging area from below and move everything up to the killing area. And now, it's time to give this farm a test. That test was successful. I ended up getting Bad Omen really fast. This farm is something everyone should have in their worlds. With that, I consider this Bad Omen farm complete. Now, I need to get rid of the Bad Omen effect real quick. Roughly 90% of you watching this aren't subscribed. You might watch my videos all the time and think you're subscribed, but you're actually not. For each subscriber I get, I'll place one block in the world. Last video, I got 34 subscribers. Subscribe now as you're well on the way towards 10,000 subscribers. Next up, let's work towards building the raid farm. So first of all, the resources required to build this farm are a tad bit insane. It's only 7,484 items. Fortunately, I already have some of this stuff sitting around in the world. So over at the village area, I had a bunch of stone saved from chests from when I mined that area out. So that saved me a bunch of time. I just need to craft this into the stone related items we need. I also collected some shulkers of logs because we're going to need that later on. Before we continue, we should probably handle this storage situation. So... Ah, much better. Now that the storage situation is sorted, let's head over to the nearby desert once again to gather sand. I should probably build a sand dipper at some point. And while we get the sand smelted, let's gather everything else we need. Okay, I'm almost finished gathering resources. I'm still missing two things, a honey block and four beacons. I thought I had a honey block around here, but I can't find it. Oh well, let's get some into bottles and now it's time to find some beehives. While I was collecting that honey, I also collected the beehives. I have a plan for these in a future episode. And when it comes to getting beacons, I'll get them after we finish building the raid farm. So, with all of these resources ready to go, let's start work on this raid farm. To build this, we're going to need a decently sized ocean fairly close to the pillager outpost with a village nearby. This ocean should be perfect. Now, let's start constructing this farm. First, we need to clear a chunk of this ocean all the way down to Y20. Let's place some walls to hold back the water. And now, let's drain this thing. Since I don't have sponges yet, we'll have to do this the old fashioned way, using sand. 
Okay, now that the water is gone, we still have a long way to go. We should have done this in a deep ocean biome. Oh well, let's get the pick out and clear this all the way down to Y20. The process of digging out this chunk was excruciatingly slow. I kept on encountering dirt and gravel, which slowed me down substantially, and lots of water-filled caves. The sand came in handy for those. At the end, I realised that I'd forgotten my beacon. It was still over at the villager area. I'll remember that for next time. At the bottom, I placed a floor of glowstone to light things up, followed by a layer of glass on top. I then placed the first of many villager holding cells. Next up, let's build the first large collection of villagers. The top of the area we just cleared out should be perfect. I'll populate this once the raid farm is complete. This module and the others to follow make use of redstone, so we need a way to transfer a signal from the top of the farm all the way to the wall. There are several ways we can do this. We could have a redstone line going all that way, use some slime stone, or we could use the far superior wall. Updating a wall at the top will send a signal right to the bottom. Now, let's take this wall up and into the sky. Part way up, I need to build a second villager module. I then pillar up some more and build a final villager module right below where the farm will be. I also make a start to the bottom of the storage system with some pistons. And I build a large glass platform to store all of my shulkers and to gain access to the storage system. Now I add the finishing touches to the wall pillar so the construction of the bottom section is now complete. Since that section is done, my new goal is to get the storage system mostly complete. This storage system is quite interesting. Typical raid farms make use of a standard chest wall and nothing else. We can't do that for this design. This design would fill a standard chest wall in under an hour. Not great when you plan to AFK for multiple hours at a time. To make the most efficient use of space, we'll be making a storage system that uses shulkers. Approximately 300 shulker boxes per hour that we AFK. The shulker loaders we are using in this farm are quite large because they operate at two times hopper speed, meaning we need less of these modules to get the same results. Unfortunately, this means that I'll have to go crawling through the system later on to get the AM sorters working properly. Now that I've explained how the storage system works, let's build it really fast. Before I finish the storage system, I place a large beacon base, enough to support 4 beacons, followed by the item water stream. This means I can now cover all of this with a final layer of glass. Now we get to the main event. Let's build the final section of this farm. This is where we spawn the raids and kill them soon after. First, let's connect what we've just built to the wall signal. For this, I'm making use of a leaf block and a strip log. This sounds a bit mad, but there's a perfectly good reason. Leaves have a variable that checks how far the nearest log is. You can see this in the F3 screen. We can manipulate that by moving the log using a sticky piston. When we do this, the leaf variable updates, which can be detected with an observer producing a one tick redstone pulse. We send that redstone signal into the iron trapdoor, which is adjacent to the wall. When the trapdoor is powered, the wall shape updates and sends a signal all the way down to the villager holding modules below the farm. After getting that done, I need to build the section where the reds will die and the items are collected. This system is quite complex. I will stand in the middle, attacking an armor stand every 10 game ticks or so. The splash damage from my sword, in this instance a sweeping edge 3 sword, will move to another armor stand within the bowels of the farm, activating the pressure plate sending a redstone signal throughout the entire farm and killing the raids at the same time. Now that the underlying mechanics of this farm have been explained, let's get it finished. So while we're getting this farm finished, I made a few critical errors. I spent some additional time after getting things finished making sure everything was fixed and ready to go. Then I finally added the last bit of the story system which is the ability to turn the shulker loaders on and off. And with that, the construction phase of this raid farm is complete. Now we need to create the nether side of this farm. Fortunately, this will be quick and easy to do. First, let's activate the nether portals within the farm. Then I need to go through to find out where we need to place this segment. This place won't work. Right, let's deactivate this portal and make for the nether roof. On the roof, I need to make a 3x3 nether portal. 
When it comes to setting up nether portals, you need to know two things. The overworld coordinates and the nether coordinates of your portals. For the overworld coordinates, I picked a location between the portals within the farm and I took note of the X and Z coordinate. To transform these into nether coordinates, I simply divide them by 8. And there you go, your portals are now perfectly aligned. The whole reason we need this portal system is to kill ravagers. We can't do that right now. We can fix this by building a glass chamber around the nether portal and filling it with lava. And with that, the nether side of the farm is now complete. Now, I need to fill this farm with 37 villagers. To breed the villagers needed for this, I'll use the villager setup over in the villager area. Breeding all the villagers needed for this project took several hours. Once that was done, I set up the required infrastructure to move the villagers over and into the raid farm. The easiest and fastest way to do this was using the nether. Once that infrastructure was in place, I was able to quickly fill each module with villagers. Now, I'm at the stage where I can start using this farm, but I still have a problem. My current sword won't work with this farm. My sword has a fire aspect enchantment which will destroy the armor stand. This will have to be replaced. So what I'd like to do is make a brand new sword for general use, a sword dedicated for this farm, and a helmet since I don't have one of those yet. These are all enchanted as well. Good thing we have villagers for that. While I'm at it, I should probably get Swift Sneak 3 on my leggings. This means I'll have to travel over 5,000 blocks to find the nearest ancient city. This is the first I've tackled an ancient city since it was released in 1.19. I snuck around the outside walls of the city removing skull creakers and looking for chests. Doing so, I found lots of loot, including two enchanted golden apples and a Swift Sneak 3 book, all without summoning the Warden. Since I like to go overboard in this game, let's upgrade all of this new gear to Netherite. I also want to upgrade the other tools in my inventory, which means we will need 6 pieces of Netherite, which translates to 24 pieces of ancient debris. I have the perfect mining spot for this in the Nether. I was down there mining for around 2.5 hours. After collecting all that ancient debris, I quickly went to the gold farm to repair my tools and to collect 24 gold. I then used this in combination with the Netherite scrap I got from smelting the ancient debris, to create 6 netherite ingots. And now, after nearly a year in this world, all of my gear is now fully upgraded to netherite. This upgraded gear was now perfect for hunting wither skeletons, which is ideal considering we need 4 beacons for this farm. I was only in the nether for about an hour before I had the 12 wither skulls I needed. Then it was just a case of going to the end and using the central end portal to quickly kill 4 withers. It then took only a few minutes to craft and install the beacons and to apply the required effects. I also used this time to add the farm sword to the wall using an item frame. And now, this farm is ready to go. Before I use this farm, I need to deal with the storage situation. As it currently stands, we will go through 300 shulker boxes per hour that we use this thing. But, I plan on expanding this, so I will need a lot more. The issue is that I can't currently craft that amount. To start, my shulker farm is completely broken, and I farm all of my wood manually. Let's fix that. First, let's work on a wood farm. My favourite type of wood to farm is spruce. I typically farm them by laying out a bunch of saplings to grow 2x2 two two spruce trees. This gets lots of wood, but takes ages to remove. What if I told you there's a farm that can do all of that? The resources required are a tad bit insane as you can see here. Fortunately, I've gathered a lot of this stuff already from when I did my resource collection earlier on. Let me get them organised real quick. There we go. For this farm, I'm going to build it in the spawn chunks and will most likely move it elsewhere later on in the world. This farm is broken up into three parts. The first is a bone meal farm which supplies 15,000 bone meal every hour. It converts stone to moss, then passes the moss through a composter to create bone meal. I'll build this one first. This bone meal farm was designed by Omango and is fast and easy to use. Plus, it's easy to expand. I'll be using this design a lot later on in the world. Next up, we have the tree farm itself, which was designed by Activation. This thing is quite complex. The design is completely free of honey, which is great considering that I don't have a farm for that. Plus, it produces 161,000 logs per hour. The final part I need to construct is the storage system, which for the sake of time, I'll go with a bunch of shulker loaders. These shulker loaders are far more primitive than the ones used in the raid farm and are easier to build and work with. And with that, the wood farm is complete. I will still need to fill the storage system with shulkers, so I should probably build a new shulker farm. This new shulker farm should be a bit simpler and easier to build, mainly because it uses a bunch of scaffolding blocks. Fortunately, I have a small bamboo farm back in my starter base, which should be more than enough for this project. After harvesting a bunch of bamboo and doing a lot of crafting, I have all the resources needed for this project. When it comes to making this farm, I'm going to build it right behind the tree farm. Since this farm was a bit simpler than the previous one, I was able to build it a lot faster. It's made up of two elements, the central area where the snow golems fire at the shulker and the spawning platforms around that, which are made of alternating layers of scaffolding and slabs. This leads up top to where the shulkers die due to entity cramming, 
and their drops are collected in this chest. This farm produces 750 shulker shells per hour, so I might need to expand this storage system in the future. Now I need to get this farm up and running by getting a shulker. I've went ahead and set up a rail line with an actuated rail at the end. This should eject the shulker into the farm. Normally I'd have to go and collect a shulker from the end, but I already have two back at spawn from when I first built the original shulker farm. I'll use one of these shulkers and we'll keep the other one as backup. And after a few moments, this shulker was in the farm meaning that the shulker farm is now complete. And after all of that, I want to do an AFK session with both the shulker farm and the tree farm running. With the shulker farm, it's just a case of flicking a lever, but with the tree farm, it's a bit more complicated. First, I need to jumpstart the bone meal farm. I can do this by inserting some handmade bone meal into the farm and flicking this lever. After a few minutes, this farm should be up and running. I'll let this run until it starts to fill the tree farm with bone meal. Then, it's just a case of turning on the tree farm, entering the minecart in the middle, and going AFK while I place these saplings. That AFK session got off to a bumpy start. That tree farm kept on breaking because of some composters I placed in the story system. I wasted quite a bit of AFK time before fixing the problem. After that, the farm worked perfectly. As you can see from that chest, I got a lot of wood in the time this thing was working. About 55,000 logs of my math is correct. This was a good investment. The shulker farm also worked perfectly during that time. But it stopped all other hostile mobs from spawning. The success of both of these farms means that I can populate the raid farm with shulkers. But first, I need to make a few changes. This raid farm produces 898,000 drops every hour. But with the current storage setup, we only store a small percentage of that. This needs to be expanded massively. Since I already have the design, building this should be fairly fast. This new expanded storage system will be used to store all of the redstone, gunpowder, glowstone and balls that this farm produces. I'm also making a massive section at the end to store emeralds. Now you may have noticed that I left a large gap between the emerald storage and everything else. This is because we're going to store the totems in this section. Sorting and storing totems within dying is an interesting challenge because totems are unstackable items and will break traditional item sorrows. However, with recent updates to the game, that's no longer a challenge. I simply need to make use of an allay, three to be exact. Back at the pillager outpost, there are two allays in a cage. I can duplicate them using an amethyst shard. And for the sake of this story system, I'm going to put them in minecarts and move them over to the raid farm. I'm going to go with a chest wall at the bottom to store the totems and we'll leave some space where the hopper should be at the top for the allays. To get them to fill the totems properly, I'm setting up some redstone with no blocks. That way when I use the farm, I need to flick this all over for this system to work perfectly. Now, all I need to do is move the lays into this hole, cover it up, and this story system is ready to use. I now have the tedious task of crawling through the internals of the item fillers, filling them with the required items. I'm also going to destroy all other items right before the emeralds section, because I don't need emeralds right now. Plus, it would eat through my shulker supply rapidly. And then, for the sake of keeping things nice, I'll use some item frames to label the story system. After all of that, I'm finally ready to use this farm. It's just a case of going to the bad omen farm, using it for a few minutes to get the bad omen effect, then coming back over here to the raid farm and beginning my first AFK session. That AFK session was a huge success. I got shulker upon shulker of redstone, glowstone, gunpowder and balls, plus an insane amount of tomes. I'm never going to die in this world. So I suppose I should probably burn most of this. Nah, just kidding. I'm saving this for later because chances are we're going to need it. I'm going to transform this ocean monument in Minecraft Hardcore, turning it into a crazy farm that generates mounds of items per hour. To do this, I'm going to destroy the monument, build the farm, remove a lot of the world and then finally finishing it off with a custom ocean monument bald. But before we do that, we need to raid an ocean monument. I've picked out an ocean monument that's only a few hundred blocks from spawn. For the sake of speed, I'll make use of some slime blocks, redstone blocks and TNT so that we can blast our way into the monument straight to the Elder Guardians. Doing this made killing all three of them a quick and simple task to complete. Once I removed the mining fatigue effect, I went looking for the sponge room within the monument, ending up with a lot of sponges. These will be useful later on. Now, let's move towards removing this ocean monument. Since I've been working underwater for a lot of this project, setting up a conduit sounds like a good idea. I went and raided a nearby shipwreck looking for a buried treasure map. This map led me back to spawn where I found a buried chest containing a heart of the sea. This could then be combined with nautilus shells to create a conduit. But I didn't have enough, so I went looking for my OP fishing rod, found it and went to do some fishing.
After only a few hours, I had enough shells, so I finally crafted the conduit. Going back to the monument, I went beneath it, stole a few blocks, and then built the conduit in the frame to go with it, giving me the water breathing effect. Now, I could start removing the monument right now, but all these gardens are going to slow me down. We can fix that. All we need to do is stop them from spawning. We can do that by building a mob switch. This essentially keeps hostile mobs loaded at all times, filling the mob cap, meaning that nothing new can spawn. Fortunately, this will be a quick and relatively pain-free process, as I already have all the required materials back at base. After collecting those materials, I went back to the spawn chunks and picked up a location right next to the shulker farm. I had this whole thing built in under 10 minutes. Then it was just a simple case of moving the shulkers from the farm into the mob switch. So at this point, all I need to do is turn this thing on with my bow, and also mob spawning is disabled elsewhere in the world. Meaning, I can finally start removing this ocean monument. This should be plenty of space for this farm. Unlike other designs, the one I'm using takes up the full monument bounding box and it requires an insane amount of resources. Sounds like a lot of work, but that's why I'm here. So I'm going to be building most of this farm using 21,000 cobblestone. That's about 12 and a half shulker boxes. I'm not mining that by hand. Fortunately, I can build a cobblestone farm. This design is relatively complex and requires all these materials, which are easy to acquire. After getting these shulkers filled, I need to build this farm. Since I need it quick, I'm going to build it here in the star base. This area on the surface should work great. Now, when it comes to running this farm, all I need to do is activate this circuit, then quickly jump down before I get blown up. Then all I need to do is fill the 12.5 shulkers I need manually. I'm going to automate this process at some point. So that marks off one of the resources required for the guardian farm. Next up, I need three shulkers of obsidian. This is easy to do because I still have a bunch of obsidian stored in the end from back when we destroyed the end island. I then went and collected a bunch of soul sand and crafted a lot of cobblestone slabs. Now all I need to do is collect these shulkers move them over to the ocean, then I can finally start building this thing. Now, I know this farm looks big when compared to other designs, but it really is, especially when you compare it to the next phase of this project. The next phase of this project involves me removing all the terrain around the farm, taking it way down to bedrock. That's going to be a lot of work. To start, we need to deal with all of this water. I can start removing this immediately, as it will fill back in. First, I need to build a wall. This wall will involve tens of thousands of blocks. I'll be using cobblestone for this. Now, I don't want to store all that cobblestone manually, so now I think it's time to automate our cobblestone farm storage setup. This is going to be a mix of water streams and shulker loaders. Four times hopper speed shulker loaders to be exact. Now I can sit here AFK and all these shulkers will be filled manually. Then, it's just a case of taking these out of storage, move them over to the garden farm, and I can finally start building this wall. To make things interesting, I'll be going with a circular wall. This circle is 600 blocks across. That big that I needed a render distance mod to show the whole thing. This area is huge. Draining this is going to take a long time. I'm going to need a lot of sand. However, mining sand is far too slow. So let's dupe it instead. To build this dupe, I need a lot of redstone materials. Gathering these took a while. I also gathered some additional materials in this second shulker box. After picking them up, we need to find a stronghold. For this stupid, I'll use the stronghold I found back in my first 100 days. Before I start building anything, I need to expand this area. I only pushed the walls out by a few blocks. Now, I need to remove the portal frame using this neat little trick. Red mushrooms are OP. After doing that three more times and removing the mushrooms, I'm ready to construct this duper. Building this duper was fairly straightforward. I went up layer by layer, double checking everything as I went. After finishing that, I wrapped this part of the project up by building a chunk loader, both the overworld side and the nether side. This means I can keep this side of the duping setup loaded permanently. Before we start using this thing, we need a storage system in the end. That's where this extra shulker of materials from earlier comes in handy. This storage system was really quick to build. Like other systems used in this video, it is shulker based. After building that, all I had to do was fill this storage system with shulkers, go back to the overworld to turn on the chunk loader, and then finally turn on the duper. I then went AFK in the end to then come back to a storage system full of sand, meaning I could start draining the area around the garden farm. But first, I had to go and turn the duper off, and in doing so, I broke it, so I'd spent 10 minutes fixing everything. After fixing that duper, I came to the realisation that I need a lot more sponges. A few stacks at least. So, I gathered some monument raiding supplies, then spent the next few hours raiding nearby monuments, ending up with a lot of sponges, most of which had to be dried out using the nether. 
this will speed up the draining process. I then collected the sand that was in the end storage, went to repair my gear, then flew over to the Guardian farm, meaning the draining phase of this project could begin. To start, I'm going to section off a really small area, an area with a width that is perfect for using sponges. Draining this section was a quick process. Gathering all those wet sponges took a while. Now that I look at it, that was a really small section. Draining it this way will take thousands of hours. I have another idea. Why don't I use flying machines? I saw a design by Raceworks from a few years ago that should be perfect for this project. In a creative world, I've prepped a large section of water and I have this machine over here ready to go. All I need to do is update this observer and the machine is away. Look at it go. This thing is really fast and it moves a lot of water at once. Let's build it. The issue is that it requires a lot of resources I don't currently have, mainly lots of slime blocks and honey blocks. So to build this machine, I'll need two things. I'll need to expand the slime farm, then build a honey farm. Expanding the slime farm was a straightforward process. I added a bunch of extra spawning platforms. I've been meaning to do this for over a year now. That cobblestone farm from earlier came in handy. So with the slime farm sorted, let's work on this honey farm. First, I need a lot of bees. I don't currently have any, so it's time to do some exploring. After a while, I had a bunch of beehives and some bees. I then had the idea to build a bee breeding setup. So I crafted a bunch of campfires, fence gates, and collected some flowers. Then I built a quick and simple breeding setup. To breed all these bees, I'll use the poppies from the iron farm. For the honey farm design I have in mind, we'll need 80 beehives full of bees. So I started breeding. After a few hours, I had all the bees needed for this honey farm. I then went and gathered all these resources. Then I found a spot in the nether roof that was perfect for this farm. I managed to fit the entire thing within the range of a chunk loader, meaning I could have it running at all times. The only thing I had to do now was place all of these beehives. Now, before I turn it on, I need 80,000 balls. Good thing we have a sand duper. Turning that sand into glass will take a long time, so I decided that a temporary super smelter would be useful. Once again, the surface above the starter base would work great. I only had a small amount of coal to start this, so I used it to smelt a few shulkers of logs, giving me lots of charcoal. This charcoal was then used to smelt all the glass needed for these balls. After AFKing for a bit, all of the glass was ready to go, so I spent a while crafting them into balls. I then moved all the balls over to the honey farm and filled the whole thing. Then all I had to do was activate the chunk loader and turn on the farm. I then flew back to the base and went AFK at the slime farm. I ended up with a lot of honey bottles that needed to be crafted into blocks. Same with the slime. Then I had to collect a few other resin components, meaning I had all the resources required for this draining machine. After collecting this box of resources, I'm going to fly over to the garden farm area. My first priority is to test this within the circle. First, I'm setting up an other portal so that I can dry off my sponges if the need arises. This deep part of water here should work perfect for this test. As this is a simple design, the building process was fairly fast. So, to activate this machine, all I need to do is update this observer and the flying machine is away. Oh no, I think I messed up. The water isn't being removed. I need to stop this machine real quick, then build a wall around it in the water below and then I'll drain that entire section. That way when we go to activate this machine, the water will be removed. I just need to remove the kelp from the boundaries to stop it filling back in. I followed the machine, removing the kelp as I went, and 5 minutes later it collided with the wall at the far side of the circle. This machine is a must have for anyone that's draining an ocean like I am. I can now use this section to easily build the draining machine over and over again to remove the ocean. I'll be starting with the deepest sections first. I spent many days working away at this project, putting in a few hours here and there. I used some sand from earlier on to build some temporary walls to help with the draining process. As you can see, we've made a lot of progress already. The water remaining within the circle will be a little harder to remove. I'll section parts of this water off and use my sponges. Once again, many days were spent on this. I also use the machine here and there. Now that all the water is removed, this is looking really cool. With the water removal phase of the project completed, we can now work towards removing all this terrain. I'm going to be using TNT dupers, so to protect the outer walls, I'm going to mine them down to bedrock, then I'll cover them with water, giving them blast protection. I also mine out a border around the garden farm, then I cover it with water as well. Now, all the important bits are protected. So the TNT dupers I have in mind for this project need guardrails, as I don't want them flying off elsewhere in the world, destroying all my other builds. I'll be using glazed terracotta for this. So, taking a quick trip to the nearby mesa, gathering all the terracotta required, then using the super smelter I built earlier to smell all the glazed terracotta needed for this project. Then, it was just a case of going over to the garden farm and building the boundary. I need to make this boundary a bit bigger than the current circle so that the TNT dippers can remove everything. I'll probably have to build more of these during the course of the terrain removal. Now, it's time for the fun bit. Let's work on that TNT duper. 
The resources required for this are really easy to get at this point. After picking those up, it's time to head back over to the Guardian Farm. I'm going to build this TNT duper very carefully. One wrong move and things could go bad. To start this duper, all I need to do is remove all of these chests, then update this observer, and the TNT duper is away. Let's have some fun. After letting the TNT duper run across the whole area once, I had to build some new guardrails lower down so that I could run it again. I also had to build some around the guardian farm so that things didn't break. Let's just say it would have been better if I built the guardian farm last. As I got further and further down, the machine got faster to run. It did however start leaving some floating blocks. I hate deep slate. Then, once the bedrock started appearing, I knew it was close to the end. This area is insane. I've never done a project like this before. We have so much space down here. This has got to be the largest ocean monument transformation in Hardcore Minecraft. Now we can't leave the project as it currently is, so let's work towards building something here. To start, I need to tidy things up. First, I need to remove the water from these walls. Having blocks for this would be helpful. Then, it should just be a case of quickly placing this top layer of blocks, removing all of the water. But, it isn't that simple. I need to go around this entire thing making repairs. This water was useless. So here's a before shot, and here's an after shot. This is looking much better. Now, I need to remove the water from this farm, make repairs, then remove the terrain beneath it, leaving us with this insanely tidy area which is ready for building. Now, I've had an idea for this build since the start of the world. Before I start, let's head into a creative testing world. So, what I have in mind for this is we do a large monument build in the middle, the monument being represented by this block. Then we do a circular perimeter around it. Now I don't want these walls to be flat, so let's step them back giving us three levels. These levels will have grass and trees. Since the walls will be a big part of this, I need to work in their texturing. I can't make them too detailed as it will take away from the central build. So, I'll keep them flat and we'll use a mix of different blocks. I want to start with some grey tones at the bottom, then moving up to a light grey concrete like texture. Here's a mix of blocks that will work. Getting them in a nice gradient is another thing entirely. I have an idea for this. I'm going to summon my inner Bob Ross and we'll use this canvas. Using world data, I'm going to break it up into different sections. The bottom section will be the darkest and the top section will be the lightest. Then when it comes to selecting blocks, I'll use the world edit replace function to fill it in. Here's the command and block percentages I used. Then I do this for each individual layer, changing the materials and percentages as I went, ending up with this masterpiece. While you admire that, I went and designed everything else, but you'll need to keep on watching to see the finished build. So, jumping back onto the hardcore world, I have a truly insane resource list to put together. I need over a million items. If I could get a subscriber for each item, that would be great. Fortunately, I can farm a lot of these. Let's focus on the wool items first, by building a wool farm. Here's all the resources I need for this farm, which I already have a lot of. I do, however, need a bunch more sheep, so let's breed some. Then, I got to work building the sheep farm in record time, plus moving all the sheep into place. Since I'm going to be in the area for a while, I'll leave it turned on while I work on the next items. I'm going to need a lot of concrete. Now I can use a sand duper to do concrete powder, but concrete is another story. Converting it manually takes far too long. Once again, I can build a machine for this. I decided to build it right next to the starter base, allowing for easy use. Then it was just a case of giving it a quick test run. All I need to do is place my blocks here, and then these blocks have moved over into the blast chamber where they're blown up and stored automatically. To get all the required resources, I'm going to need to AFK for a while. First, I'm going to prep the storage needed to house all of these items. This island next to the garden farm should work great. These chests will hold around 700 chokers. After being AFK for many hours, these chests are full, meaning I can officially start construction. I'm going to start with the outer wall so that I can hide all the old terrain. Here, I'm making use of that gradient technique I showed you earlier. At first, I was building this layer by layer, but at some point I decided to do this in sections instead. When I got to the grass section, I placed a layer of cobble so that it looked better for now. Then I continued up to layer 2 and then finally layer 3. The walls in the final layer were taller and more exaggerated to make the build feel larger than it was. This place looks completely different with these walls finished. This gradient looks great, especially from far away. This whole place is looking a little grey though, so it's time for a splash of colour. Let's place some grass. Wait a minute, what's the ocean grass texture like here? Let me get some grass real quick. Placing that grass down, I'm not liking it. No, that doesn't look good at all. Let's get rid of it. Instead what we'll do is we'll use a gradient method from earlier on to build our own grass texture. Good thing I planned ahead for this. The grass gradient looks far more vibrant than regular grass. It makes use of moss blocks, green wool and concrete powder. 
That was the splash of colour this build needed. This is looking great. It will look even better once it's completely full of trees. We won't be building default ones, let's do some custom ones for this build. I'm jumping into a creative world once again to show you how I build my custom trees. First I start off with the central trunk. I build it almost as high as the final tree will be. Then I return to the base of the tree and I expand it making it look nice and organic. I then move up the tree and I start placing my branches. I always go with 4 large branches coming off in each direction. I twist and turn them at random giving it a unique shape. I then add slabs and stairs here and there to help with the overall shape. Then I use fences to make smaller branches. And finally I start adding layers of leaves, with lots of fair pockets in between them. I feel that these types of trees look better using this method. If you want to do your own custom tree, following this little mini tutorial you can have your own custom tree in under 5 minutes. Back in the hardcore world I got to building all these trees. I used 3 different designs using the method I just showed you but with different blocks, making the forest feel more diverse. I went layer by layer as I thought it looked better for the time lapse and I have to admit it looked great. Flying around this place now feels so much better. It's looking amazing. I can even fly between all of the trees. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get to the main event. Let's work on this central build. So when it came to designing this central build, I wanted to do something interesting. Almost everyone that does these transformations will keep the original shape of the ocean monument and might switch out the blocks. Then there are others that do a small custom build. I wanted to be different. First of all, I wanted this build to be massive. It had to go from bedrock to above sea level. I achieved this by doing a multi-level build, similar to the outer wall. That way I had multiple layers that could contain other structures and builds. The main inspiration for this build was an ancient Sumerian ziggurat, with a hint of ancient Greek architecture here and there. Part of this build was inspired by the ocean monument transformation Trixie Blocks done. You should check that out after this video. I also wanted the player to be able to walk from the bottom of the build all the way to the top, allowing me to expand the build and add to it in the future. This transformation is insane, it looks amazing. At this point, I'd say the exterior phase of this project is complete. I don't have a name for this project yet, I'm thinking something Atlantis related. Leave your suggestions in the comments. Now the exterior might be finished but the interior is another question. I've got a lot of space down here, let's focus on getting this farm operational. Right now it won't work as the gardens will teleport to the nether with nowhere to go. I need a killing system. The results of the qualifier set system are easy to come by. The issue will be constructing it in the nether safely. So I'll be placing the killing system below the nether roof which isn't exactly safe so I'll have to do this really fast. This area close to the nether fortress is where this will be built. Building this system was a fairly quick process, I just had to remove a bit of lava here and there and then build the rest of it. That came together really quick. So the gardens will appear at the top of this then they'll fall and die down here. Then the items will fall further and then go through this portal. Now I need to go back to the overworld to handle these items. The storage for this will be built below the farm. Due to the sheer quantity of items, shulker loaders will be used for this. The items will shoot out of the portal down there, then they'll follow the water streams ending up in these shulker loaders. I've split these up so that I can have a separate chest wall for each item. Then I'll burn all of the other stuff I don't want. And with that out of the way, the garden farm is ready to go. Before I actually start using this farm, I want to get this interior finished. It will have to be a large one to fit this space. I'll probably end up removing the current floor as I want the inside to have a different feel. Let's get started. As you can see straight away, the materials for this interior differed massively when compared with the materials used outside. I wanted the inside to have a nice warm feeling to it as the exterior block palette didn't do that. Most of this interior will make use of brown earth tones provided by the wood, then some highlights provided by the carpets and bushes. I lit this space using sea lanterns, both visible and hidden ones, plus the use of additional lanterns here and there. I also wanted to avoid having one long hallway, hence why this interior is broken up into multiple sections. Yes, it will make me take a bit longer to access the farm items, but that's the sacrifice I'm willing to make in order to have this interior make sense. Besides, I can use all these twists and turns to branch off into other farms in this build later on. And the best bit about it is it only took 2 hours to build all of that. Now, let's do a walkthrough of this interior. First of all, this entrance looks blocked off, but that's not the case. If I push this button, the wall will slide down, revealing our interior, where we are immediately greeted with a wall. Lines of sight are important in this build. It forces you to look at the smaller details as you navigate around. Speaking of small details, what do you think of my diamond statues? Subtle flex, I know, but you can do the same if you get your diamond dharma from villagers. And I have a great many of them. Continuing on through the build, I have hallways and rooms here and there which helps to fill up the space. We then come to this sparsely decorated hallway with buttons in the floor. Once again, these are doors. The areas behind them are the storage silos for farms that will eventually be hooked up here. I can also access the rest of the monument using this door. 
Same on the other side. After closing these up, let's continue. After a few more twists and turns, we end up at the Guardian Farm storage. This looks much better than what we originally had. I also went ahead and installed an overflow system just in case the storage fills up. And in the opposite side, a quick way to reload the shulker loaders below. This is mirrored at the other end of the hallway. At this point, I'd say the interior phase of this project is now complete. Now, let's make use of this interior as I want this place to have multiple uses. The first thing I have in mind is a tree farm. I already have a really good tree farm back in the spawn chunks. Let's move this one over to the monument. I started by removing the roof which was larger than I remembered. Good thing is I won't be needing this roof for this project. Then I removed the farm beneath it, making sure to collect all the items. I ended up leaving the storage system there as I'd have to enter that later on. I also went ahead and dismantled the bone mill farm as the tree farm would be useless without it. Then it was just a case of getting it built over in the monument. As I've done this before, building it again was a quick and simple process. That and I didn't have to worry about fixing anything due to the placement of the storage module. Then I went ahead and gave it a quick test run to verify that everything was working perfectly. And there we go, this farm is ready to go once again. I went and rebuilt the storage for this off camera and made sure that it was linked to both the farm and the storage silos built inside the interior. Now all I need to do is go and empty the old storage, take all the empty shulkers then remove it. Next up I'd like to work on a dedicated crafting area as I have a few projects coming up that will require millions of crafted items. Plus I need a quick system to craft up the drops from this garden farm. The resources required for what I have in mind I already have a lot of. So let's build this thing. This mass crafting system was designed by Amango and can be used to craft 3.5 million items per hour. It will require the use of the item scroller mod to be used properly. This system also requires you to input full shulkers of each item, so I won't be able to use this thing properly for a little while. And there we go, this mass crafting system is ready to go. I have a feeling that I'll be using this a lot in the near future. Next, I'd like to work on a new super smelter. I know I bought one earlier, but I'm not a fan of it. I want something a little bit different. The design I have in mind is relatively simple, requiring all of these items. So, let's build it. This super smelter design was made by Cubic Meter. It contains 64 furnaces allowing for faster smelting than our current setup. It also uses a lot of redstone. This redstone is used to time how long it will take to smell items, where it will then send more plus some additional fuel, allowing it for increased efficiency. So, to use a super smelter, I start by inputting a small amount of fuel. I'm going with 64 charcoal. That's one per furnace. I'm going to smell up 27 stacks of logs to make more fuel for this thing. So, the general idea is that the tree farm over there will fuel this smelter. So after inputting the items and turning on the system, I didn't have to wait long for all the items to be smelted. This setup is far superior to the one back at the starter base. Now that all of that's out of the way, let's use this Guardian farm. First of all, I need an AFK spot. This AFK spot will be above the entire build, meaning we can see everything while we wait for this farm to run. I'm going to power up to Y160. This will be the perfect height for this AFK spot. I went ahead and built a box with a door on the side, meaning that I'll be safe from phantoms while I AFK. Even with that done, I still can't use this farm. I haven't let this build up whatsoever, meaning more mobs will spawn outside of the farm than inside it. Let's fix that. I'm going to start by lighting up the interior using some sea lanterns. That's so much better. When it comes to lighting up the exterior, I'm going to do things a little different. First, I'm going to place some sea lanterns in the ground across the entire central build. Then I cover them up with carpets, making them blend in. I also do this on the roofs of the buildings. Now, this entire build should be mob proof. The exterior walls are outside of the spawning radius, I won't bother lighting them up. So now, let's do a one hour AFK session. That AFK session was a massive success. I ended up with all this loot. Using shulker box loaders was a good call. It's actually amazing looking at how much I've done in this project. Starting off with nothing more than an ocean. Building a farm, draining said ocean, removing all the terrain, then ending up with this amazing build. Let me know what you think about it in the comments. I'm going to destroy the world in Minecraft Hardcore. Well, not the entire world, just this part of it. I'll accomplish this by marking out the area, digging out the trenches, building a world eater, then removing all the terrain getting insanely rich in the process. How many diamonds will I end up with? Watch the whole video to find out. To start, I need to find a suitable area, which will involve a lot of exploring. This area up ahead should work great. Let me land real quick. This area looks flat enough, so let's get started. First, I'm going to mark out the corners of this area using slime blocks. 64 slime blocks in each corner should work fine. I'm going to have to remove some of these leaves. Then I pillar up in the first corner. I'll use this as a vantage point throughout this project. 
This area will be 256 blocks across, so I need to fly 16 chunks before placing more slime blocks. I'm making these chunk borders visible using F3 plus G to make this easier. I also use these chunk loaders to align these slime blocks with the others I just placed. Then I repeat what I did for the third corner and finally the fourth. There we go, all corners are marked out. Now before I do anything else I need to set up a way to travel quickly between here and the starter base. I'll be building a nether portal for this over there in that meadow biome. This will be a staging area for this project. After lighting the portal, I'm going to go through it so that I can quickly travel back to base. After disabling that portal, I realised that I am lost. So, after flying blindly for a while, I finally made it back to my ladder to the roof. So, I climbed it. Then, set up the portal on the nether roof, allowing for fast travel to the new area. So for this world destroying project, I'd like to break it up into four phases. The first phase will be preparing the area. The second will be digging the trenches. The third will be building the world data. And the fourth will be removing all this terrain. Let's start preparing the area. First, I need to dig out the border of this area all the way down to bedrock. This will contain water later on which will protect the walls from TNT, leaving them flat. I guess I'll dedicate the next week of my life to removing all these blocks. No, I'm just kidding, it will only take a few days to do all that. With that boundary being dug out, I can finally start adding water. I could use buckets for this, but that would take a really long time, so I've got a full inventory of ice instead. Using my fortune pick, I can convert this ice into water. Doing it for the whole area took a while. I made a bit of a mess with the water while doing that, but I really don't care. We can tidy that up later on. Now that these walls are protected, let's focus on these trees. They can't be here, so let's remove them. I could use machines for this, but I won't, so let's remove them manually. These trees would interfere with later phases of this project, so they had to go. Plus, it allows me to see this whole area a lot better. This area feels huge and a bit weird since there's nothing here, but that won't last for long. With that, I consider phase 1 of this project to be complete. Let's move on to phase 2. Phase 2 involves me digging trenches on each side all the way down to bedrock. Two of these trenches need to be 15 blocks wide, and the other trenches 3 blocks wide. I'm not doing that manually. Fortunately, there's a machine for that. Here are the resources required to build it. I've used this machine once before around 2 years ago and it should still work. It's just a simple array of TNT duplets. Now if you're going to build this duper, you can't place the minecarts straight away on this, as the TNT will activate and will have to be replaced. So, how do you prime it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what to do. I add two blocks on the side of the duples, placing an activator rail and a piston. I then add a minecart and power the piston with a redstone block. Then, I remove what I just placed and the TNT duper is ready to go. This is a quick way to prime most TNT duples, so keep that in mind. So after getting those built, I also placed some obsidian at the far end right here so that the machines would bounce back. So the general idea is that the machines would fly back and forth over this area. To get this started, I'm going to flick this lever which enables this circuit to work. This basically means that when the duplers return, they run again. Then in order to activate the machine, for the first time, I press this button down here and the TNT duplers are away. Let's dig this trench. So this first trench wasn't actually wide enough, so I had to widen it with another duper. Then after making sure the walls wouldn't get in the way, I rebuilt the duper lower down and let it run again. I did this several times until I reached bedrock. Then I just had to double check that no blocks were left floating about. You can see looking at the floating obsidian that I had to build those duplers four times in order to reach the ball. Now I get to repeat all of that on the opposite side. The time went flying by as I dug out this trench, clearing all the liquids and extra blocks as I went. Let's just say I'm happy I did those water protected walls first. Now that I'm flying through this trench, we are now halfway through this phase of the project. So, let's move on to the smaller trenches. Just like with the other ones, I'm using the same TNT duplers but they are narrower since the trench doesn't need to be as wide, meaning that the trenches are faster to clear. The fourth trench was the fastest out of all of them. Now, all four trenches have been dug, meaning that phase two of this project is now complete. Let's move on to phase three. Phase three involves me building the insane machine that will remove all of this terrain. For this, I have two options. I could build the machine I used to destroy the end island, or I could build a world eater. Since I want to collect every ore within this area, the world eater will be the way to go. For this world eater, I'm going to need two shulkers of slime blocks, half a shulker of pistons, and all these other resources, totaling 4,432 blocks. Let's go and collect them. So far I've collected all these items but I'm still missing one thing, coral fans, 41 of them to be exact, which will involve me travelling several thousand blocks to the nearest coral reef. Here's an idea for the Minecraft developers, make coral fans renewable. Arriving at the nearest coral reef, I decided that building a nether portal first would be useful since I come here a lot. I should have done this a year ago. 
I also went into the nether and built the portal at the right quad that's on the nether roof. Using said portal, I arrived back in the coral reef and I started collecting the 41 coral fans needed for this machine. I'm only collecting the blue ones so that they stack nicely. Then, I'm going to dry them all out. With that done, all the resources required to build this world data have been collected. Well, all except for the minecart size. To save an inventory space, I'm going to take a shulker of iron from the iron farm. And we'll craft the minecarts over at the project area. Now, I can start building this machine. My first order of business is to place down all these shulkers, freeing up inventory space. Now, let's get started. The first part of the machine I'm working on contains the sweeper modules. These will remove any liquids they come across within the marked out area. They will also move down when the machine is activated. This was the simplest part of the vault. Next up, I'm going to focus on the activation system at that end of the machine. This part starts the entire machine and connects it to the TNT duplicate at the top through this slime block tower. Think of this entire machine as one giant flying contraption. Unlike other designs, these TNT duplicates are safe to build as the TNT can't be activated until the entire machine is. That is only if they're finished, which they're currently not. As you can see, there are no minecarts present, so I'm going to have to go through this entire thing, placing activator rules. Then, once that's done, I need to place all the minecarts. Now, this section of the machine is 100% ready to go. The only issue I have is that if I activate this machine right now, it will destroy the entire world. I can stop that from happening by building return stations on the opposite side of the marked out area. These return stations are fairly simple. All they do is stop the TNT duplicates and liquid sweepers, push them down one block, send them back, then the entire thing moves down another block. Well, that only happens if you built the entire thing correctly, so I spent the next few hours double checking everything. With those checks being finished, I'd say that phase 3 of this project is complete. Let's move on to the fourth and final phase, by activating this machine. While this machine is running, I plan to collect every ore within this area. How many ores will I end up with? While you work it out, I'm going to activate this machine by removing this redstone block. And with that, enjoy the time lapse. After only a few minor issues, the machine managed to dig its way all the way down to the bottom, in the process removing 8.5 million blocks. That's an insane amount. Now, most of those blocks were destroyed, but the walls weren't. I saved all of them and stored them in these chests. So, how many walls did we end up with? A lot. Each of these shulkers are completely full of walls, both deep slate and regular walls. Here's the exact numbers of each one. In total, I managed to save 113,000 door blocks. Now that those ores have been saved, let's tidy this place up. First, I'm going to remove the world and save each of those items. Then, I'm going to remove two of these walls of water. You'll see why shortly. And now, looking at that floor, I need to clean that up. So, there we go. So, with all that terrain being removed and this area being tidied up, I'd say that phase four of this project is now complete. Now that I look at it, this pyramid doesn't feel all that big. So, let's expand it. Let's make it twice as large. So instead of it being 16 chunks across, it'll be 32 chunks across. To get a feel for how large this will be, I'll mark out the corners just like I did earlier using slime blocks. There we go. It's a bit hard to see right now, but this is going to be a lot larger. I'm going to be approaching this entire area the same way I did with the first perimeter. First, I'm going to mine these walls all the way down to bedrock on all four sides. Then, I'll cover them with water, giving them blast protection. Due to the size of the area, I'm going to break it up into smaller sections so that the world eater doesn't break. This means I'll have to cut some additional holes in the middle of the marked out area. Now that this area has been marked out properly, let's focus on removing it. First, let's work on the trenches. Unfortunately, there's some rivers in the way, so I sectioned them off and drained them with sponges. This is for the smaller trenches, so I cleared the 16 block section of the river just to be safe. Now, let's dig the trench. I've already got the TNT duper in place, so all I need to do is activate it. Since I already did a lot of the prep work, I didn't have to clear many liquids, meaning that this trench had ran really quickly. With this trench being finished, let's move on to the next one. This next one involves no rivers, so it should be done very quickly. That wasn't actually the case due to the higher terrain, but I got there in the end. Now, I can work on the final trench for this section. This trench will contain the world deer, so it needs to be 16 blocks across, which will involve me using the large TNT duper. Just like with the other trenches, this was a fast one, probably due to the sheer amount of TNT used. This should be plenty of space for the world deer. Now that this area has been fully prepped, let's get this world deer built. Once you've built this thing once, it's fairly easy to repeat. You just need to make sure that no mistakes are made, as they can be devastating. After double checking the entire machine, I think I'm ready to activate it. Well, let's get started. Running the world eater this time was a bit more problematic. 
had to stop it a lot more to fix the sweepers at the bottom as they'd get stuck on occasion. There was also a few instances where some rogue TNT blew up part of my return stations, so those had to be completely built. That's something I'm going to be keeping an eye on going forward. Other than that, the machine ran perfectly. It didn't take long until we reached the bomb. With that world data finished running, we've removed a further 8.5 million blocks, bringing our grand total to 17 million blocks removed. That puts me halfway through this perimeter project. This place is feeling a lot larger now. Just like I did before, I saved all the ores I could and stored them in these chests. Surprisingly, I ended up with less ores than the first perimeter. Rather than showing you all the ores I collected during that world data run, I'm going to save them until the end but we'll add them all together. To save me a bit of time later, let's expand this storage to accommodate the next half of this project. Unfortunately, I don't have any wood on me right now, so I'm going to go back to the starter base real quick to craft up the 20 chests I need. Then, I'll come back to the project area and place them. There we go. That should be enough chests. Now, let's add the finishing touches to the area I just cleared. First, let's tidy up the floor by removing all that lava and those extra blocks. Fantastic. Now, I can remove this world here. As always, I'm dismantling this very carefully so that it doesn't blow up in my face. I'm making sure to save each item since I'll be rebuilding this again. Now that this has been cleared, I'd say that perimeter 2 is complete. Let's move on to perimeter 3. Just like with other perimeters, I need to focus on making the trenches first. In order to do that, I'm removing the water that is currently protecting them. I'm going to focus on making the two larger trenches first. One of these trenches crosses a large river, so I'm going to section it off and we'll use sponges to drain it. After getting that drained, I went ahead and built the trenches. So, now I can actually run this thing. Digging this trench was fairly straightforward as I'd already dealt with most of the liquids when digging out the boundary. In the end, I had to build the trenching machine four times in order to reach the bomb. Now this trench is finished, so let's move on to the second big trench. With that machine being built, let's dig this trench. I didn't have to deal with many rivers this time round, which sped this up a lot. There was still a lot of water and lava here, which was easy enough to remove, and in no time at all, I was at the bottom of this trench. Now that both those big trenches are out of the way, let's focus on the smaller ones, where once again, I'm using the smaller trenching machine. Since the terrain was far lower than in the previous sections, digging this trench was insanely fast. I didn't encounter many liquids this time round, which probably helped. With that trench being finished, let's work on the next one. I already have the trenching machine in place, so let's start it. I technically didn't need to dig this trench due to having all this extra space, but I did it anyway to minimise the odds of the world eater breaking. I'll end up doing this again once we finish this perimeter. All of the trenches have now been cleared, which means I can build the world data that will remove this entire section. When it came to the placement of this world data, I did things a little bit different. I placed it a few blocks closer to each of the boundaries in order to test if that would stop the machine from breaking later on. I also did this with the return station segment, and then double and triple checked to make sure that everything was aligned and ready to go. So, once again, let's remove that redstone block and get this show on the road. As this was the third time running this world data, it became fairly routine. I'd fly back and forth monitoring the machine ensuring that nothing was broken and had removed the obsidian and other obstacles as they appeared. Even though I took steps to ensure the machine wouldn't break, it still broke several times but fortunately I was able to stop the machine before it blew itself up. That way I could make quick repairs and get the machine going again. I was that busy keeping an eye on things that time flew by and ended up at the bottom of this perimeter. This has got to be the cleanest perimeter floor I've seen so far. One thing I did notice is that I'm missing a liquid sweeper. The return station is also damaged so where is this missing machine? I flew up out of here and I found the missing machine right there. This whole situation reminded me of an issue with the first perimeter I did. I ended up with a missing liquid sweeper there as well. I know what it is though. If we fly a few hundred blocks from here, we'll find the machine right there. At least that mystery has been solved. So looking back to the perimeter once again, I made sure to save all the ores I gathered and have them stored in these chests. I ended up finding two enchanted golden apples in dungeons. That was lucky. Now, let's focus on tidying this place up. First, I'm going to remove the extra blocks from the floor of this perimeter, meaning that no mobs can spawn here anymore. Then, I'm going to remove this world data, doing it carefully of course and saving each item. Then, I did the same for the return stations. Now this area is completely tidy, meaning that perimeter 3 of this project is now complete. Let's move on to the final perimeter of this project. In order to start making progress in this final perimeter, I need to remove the water that's currently in the way. Fortunately, I only had to remove the water from one of the walls using my sponges. I then had to wait in the area while the water was draining. Now that the last of the water has been removed, I can start chipping away at this remaining terrain. I'm going to start by digging out the trenches needed for this world here. I'll be digging three trenches in total. I'm going to start with a larger trench which will be located right here. Since there's a river running through this section, I'll spend some additional time draining the part of it that's in the way of this trench. With that section of river being drained, I can start digging out this trench. I've went ahead and built the trenching machine, so let's activate it and get this trench dug out. Digging this final trench was a straightforward process due to most of the liquids being removed before digging this out. 
Partway through digging this trench, I realised that I haven't collected any ores from the trenches I've dug during this project. I wonder how many ores I've lost so far. While I was thinking about that, I reached the bottom of this trench. That's the final large trench of this project dug out. I'm one step closer to having this place finished. Let's move on to the smaller trenches. We'll do this one right here. I went ahead and built the trenching machine, so let's get started. Just like with the previous perimeter, this trench wasn't technically necessary, but I went ahead and did it anyway. Besides, that's more super satisfying content for you to enjoy. Now, let's move on to the final trench of this project. This trench doesn't contain any rivers, so I got the trench machine built, activated it, and I'm now working my way through this terrain. In no time at all, I was at the bottom of this trench. Now, the final trench has been finished. So after removing the trench machine, I'm ready to start building the final world eater of this project. This world eater came together really quick. I've gotten so used to building these at this point. I made sure to disable the final sweeping module to avoid the issues we discovered earlier. I positioned this in such a way that it shouldn't be damaged during the process of removing this terrain. But I wasn't so lucky. With the construction of the world eater being finished and final checks being completed, let's activate this machine for the final time. As I mentioned a few moments ago, the world eater broke every so often. I believe this was due to the placement between the machine and the terrain. Of course I came to that realisation at the end of the project. Since I tackled a lot of the lava and obsidian earlier, I didn't encounter many other issues with this machine. I think if I do something like this again, I'll probably go with a different machine. Maybe that machine I used to remove the end island. Or perhaps I'll design my own world here. It's a fairly simple concept if you think about it. It's just a case of linking many smaller individual parts together. Let me know if you'd like to see something like that. And in no time at all, I was at the bottom of this 512 by 512 block perimeter. This has been an amazing project so far. Now that this terrain has been removed, I need to tidy this place up. Starting with this floor. We've got a lot of lava and extra blocks that need to be removed. That's looking a lot better. Now, I need to remove this world here. Since I won't be using this any longer, I didn't bother saving every item. At this point, it's taking up valuable inventory space. And since it can be crafted easily, I saw no point in keeping it all beyond this point. I also quickly dismantled the return stations. Now that I think about it, I could have used the trenching machines to remove this world eater for me. Words can't describe how happy I am to have this finished. Just look at this place, it's unreal. With that world eater being removed, I'd say that perimeter 4 of this project is now complete. Let's add the finishing touches. Now that everything involved in TNT has been finished, I can remove all this extra water. This is going to take a while, so let's get started. Now I have to admit, this wall of water was insanely handy in containing the explosions, but I have to say, I probably wouldn't use them again. The issue is that setting them up is very time consuming. You've got to mine all of that terrain, plug any holes, remove any liquids, and then fill it all with water. That time could have been spent a lot better. Due to the size of the area, I had to fly around a bunch so that the remaining water would be loaded long enough for it to drain properly. Now that all of the water has been removed, I can get a better feel for the scale of this place. This project actually feels complete now. I went through a lot of sponges draining that as you can see here. One thing I also forgot to mention is that I found a music disc as well, which I've been keeping in my inventory for a while. So I popped into the nether real quick to dry out all the sponges and then remove them. Now, let's deal with all these ores. The ores I collected from the final perimeter are stored in these chests. That's a lot of shulkers. Currently, I have everything sorted based on what perimeter they came from. Starting with perimeter 1 on the left, and ending with perimeter 4 on the right. In order to start counting everything, I'm using this water to clear all of the tall grass, giving me the space I need. So, let's count everything. I'm going to start by taking each ore type out one at a time. First, I'm going to be focusing on the cold ore. Let's sort the shulkers. I ended up with 56 shulker boxes worth of coal ore. That's 97,818 ore. In order to keep this area nice and tidy, I'm setting up a second storage system and we'll be storing the ores I've counted in there. Let's move on to the next type of ore. The next ore I'll be counting is the deep slate variant of coal ore. I ended up with 5 shulkers. That's 7,353 deep slate coal. After picking those shulker boxes up and sorting them away, let's move on to the next type of ore. Next up we have iron. I ended up with 27 shulkers of iron ore. That's 45,072 iron. And when it came to the deep slate variant, I had 14 shulkers of deep slate iron. That's 22,685 ore. Now, I could keep counting them like this, but that would take a while, so let's speed this up. Next up, we have gold ore. I only had two shulkers of it, so that's about 3,297 gold. Fortunately, I had a lot more when it came to the deep slate variant. The deep slate variant had 11 shulkers worth of ore. That's 17,710 deep slate gold ore. Moving on to the lapis, I had five shulker boxes of it. That's 8,414 ore. And when it came to the deep slate variant, I had seven shulker boxes. That's 11,539 ore. Moving on to the next type of ore, we have copper. I collected a lot of this. 50 shulker boxes of copper ore. That's 84,019 copper. 
That's the most copper I've ever had in any world. When it came to the deep sleep variant of it, I had three chocolates. That's 4,639 ore, so quite a bit less. Next up, we have the redstone chocolates. I only had two chocolate boxes, which was about 2,237 redstone ore. Not much, but when it came to the deep sleep variant, I had 16 chocolate boxes. That's 26,142 ore. Knowing me, I'll probably never use any of this since I get my redstone from the raid farm. And finally, the most important ore in all of Minecraft, diamonds. How many did I end up with? Well, I only ended up with one shulker of regular diamonds, and it wasn't even full. That shulker only contained 347 diamond ore, so not that much. But when it came to the deep slate variant, that was a completely different story. I had 8 shulker boxes of deep slate diamond ore. That's 11,779 ore. That's a lot of diamonds. I wonder how much it'd be if I fortuned all that up. So we went through all the ores individually, but how many did we have in total? 100,000? 200,000 maybe? That wasn't even close. It was 343,051 ores in total. That's an insane amount. Will I be using them for anything? No. Will I fortune them up? Also no. We need to do something special with all of these. Speaking of special things, why did I dig out this entire area? Obviously I was after all the ores, but there was another reason. In the future, I plan to use this area to attempt some Minecraft world records. Things that involve me placing millions of blocks. Sounds interesting, right? Well, I won't be attempting any of those until we reach 100,000 subscribers. So, if you want to see me blow some Minecraft world records out of the water, smash that subscribe button. Now, let's do something interesting with these ores. So since these ores are quite valuable, I'd like to build a vault. I won't be doing it out here as knowing me, I'd probably forget that it exists. So, where do I build it? How does a starter base sound? So for this vault, I want to place it against this wall, but we have a lot of junk in the way. This stuff has been piling up for a while now. Let's tidy this place up. I'm just going to store all of this in a chest. I'll place it back here, out of sight. Then, I can remove this stuff. Out of sight, out of mind. Now, let's work on this vault. First, let's dig out part of this wall. This will be the door to the vault. That should be enough space to start working this vault. This door is going to require a lot of redstone. I need to move this floor down 8 blocks. That should be enough space. I'm going to pull it out of here so that I can set up a ladder. This will make getting in and out of here a lot easier. Now, let's work on this door. I've went ahead and collected all the required materials. I've used this design before over on the garden farm. So, let's get this ball. There we go, the redstone for this door is now finished. Now, let's work on the activation circuit. I could use a button for this, but that's too obvious. Let's do a hidden activation system. For this, I'm going to be using a torch key to activate this door. All it requires is me placing a redstone torch over here, which activates the door circuit, allowing it to open. Then, the torch breaks, leaving no evidence of the activation method. Sounds simple enough, so let's get the redstone in place. So it looks like this redstone torch key circuit is working. Let's connect it to the door. With that redstone connected, let's get it tested. So it looks like this door is closing just fine, but when it comes to opening it, that's where we encounter issues. This system we've just installed is broken, so I spent 30 minutes working on the door before I got it working again. Now that this door is finished, I can start working on this vault. First, let's focus on hiding this door. Should just be a case of placing the blocks that were used in the walls of this place. Now, it blends in. I always make sure to test these doors once I've placed all the decorative blocks. Looks like it's working just fine. Since I'm working here, I might as well finish the roof. Only took a year and a half to finish this part. Next, I'd like to work on the interior of this vault. I'll be using iron blocks for this. This looks good, but it isn't anywhere near enough space, so let's expand it. With this extra room, I'm going to be replacing all the stone with iron blocks, and I'll be placing a lot of chests. With that half done, let's do the second half. Perfect. Now I just need to finish this place off by replacing the floor on the ceiling. I also went ahead and placed an extra crafting table and ender chest at the end of the vault, and I labelled all the chests. With this vault being complete, let's start moving all the ores. Moving all of the ores was a time consuming process, but in no time at all, all the ores had been stored within the vault. So with this project being finished, I decided to tidy this place up, removing all of these shulkers and extra blocks. At this point, I don't think I'll be adding anything else to this starter base. So this is my wheel farm and it's a bit small. So what if we transformed it to be 100 times bigger? I'm only giving myself 50 days to do this. If I fail, this vault containing thousands of diamonds will explode. Let's get started. I want to build this really far away, in a flower forest. Since I need to build this quick, let's use a Minecraft seed finder. All I need to do is enter my world seed, then look for the biome I need. Any of these seed finders will work for this. So I found a flower forest at these coordinates. Before I can start this build, I need to get out there. 
After travelling for a while, I've arrived at the flower forest in question. This should work for this project. Now, normally I'd build an airport for a project like this, but that won't be necessary. If I go in this direction, you'll be able to see the bad omen farm I bought a while back. I'll be using this portal for the duration of this project. Now, let's get to work. In order to build the insane wheel farm I have planned, I have to build a bunch of other stuff first. This wheel farm will contain 1024 sheep. That's 64 sheep per wheel colour. I'm going to need a lot of dye. We can make dyes from flowers, which is why we're building in a flower forest. Let's gather the resources needed to farm these flowers. With these resources, let's travel back to the flower forest and get started. I'm making a quick stop at the gold farm to repair my tools since I'll be removing a lot of blocks. After that quick tool repair session, I've returned to the flower forest with everything we need to build some flower farms. I want to preserve as much of this natural terrain as possible, so I'll be building these underground. Let's start this first farm. This farm is quite large so I need to start by removing a bunch of blocks, leaving me with this large room. This should be enough space. I've went ahead and filled my inventory with what I need, so let's build this flower farm. After only 5 minutes of placing blocks, this farm is finished. To turn this thing on, all I need to do is activate this lever. The water will stop flowing, bone meal will be used in the grass, and then the water will activate again. Since I don't have any bone meal or a storage solution currently, I'll turn this off for now. Now, I need to build 4 more of these farms. Each farm will give me 2 types of flowers. Since I was going to be clearing blocks for a while, I set up a hasty beacon nearby which sped up the process of building these farms by a lot. Due to the way flowers generate, I ended up placing 3 of these farms in close proximity, hence why I'm able to quickly walk between them. I still need to build 2 more farms which will require a 100 block long tunnel to access. Fortunately, these farms were also built side by side, which meant I was able to get them finished quickly. Now that all the flower farms are in position, I should probably explain why I need more than one. Flower farming can be quite complex. It's not just a simple case of building it in the correct biome. You need to build them in certain parts of the biome to get the correct flowers. I knew before starting this project that I wanted these farms to be underground, so I created a creative world using the hardcore world seed and went out to the flower forest I would use. I cleared a bunch of space underground and placed a grass platform. I set up two command blocks which would automatically remove any tall grass that would generate on the platform. Then, I used bone meal to generate the flower pattern. I could then use that pattern to work out where each farm had to be. One thing to remember if you do a project like this, is flower generation is height specific. If I went two blocks up, the flower pattern would be completely different. With that short explainer out of the way, let's continue with this project. So these five flower farms I just built will generate six different types of flowers, giving me blue, orange, red, yellow, magenta and light grey dyes. That's six out of the 16 dyes I need for this wool farm. So, how do I generate the rest? I build more farms. If I build a cactus farm, I can turn that cactus into green dye by smelting it. I've went ahead and collected the resources needed for this thing. It's a small farm, hence why the resources are in small amounts. I still need to go and collect the cacti I needed for this. I'll collect them from this desert, close to my villager area. Now, let's get back to the flower forest so that I can build it. Just like I did before, I'll be building this underground. I'm going to position it between the first two flower farms I built. Building this was straightforward. I cleared out a relatively large room, then built the farm in record time. Now this farm is operational, but I still have a problem. The furnace that smelts the cactus won't work without a fuel source. No, I won't be using coal for this. I'll be using carpets as a fuel source since I can dupe them. Jumping into a creative world real quick, here's how you build one. This design has been around for a few years and is quite reliable. I've done a short on this in the past. Back in the hardcore world, I got it built and it's now connected to the furnace, allowing for the cactus to be turned into green dye. Now, that's the first seven dyes dealt with. Next up, I'd like to work on the lime dye. With this, I have two ways of making it. I could combine the green dye from the wool farm with some white dye to create it, or I could build a dedicated farm. I'll be building a farm for this one. I can turn sea pickles into lime dye by smelting it. So I went ahead and started to collect all the resources I'd need for this farm. I'm also going to pick up some rails so that I can place a hopper minecarts during this build. Before I return to the flower forest, I need to travel out to the coral reef to collect the last few items I need. Sea pickles and some coral blocks. There we go. Now on the way back to the flower forest, I'm making a quick stop at the gold farm to repair my gear. Arriving back in the flower forest, I quickly made my way underground and have selected this wall for the sea pickle farm. I went ahead and cleared out a small room which should be enough space for this farm. Then I quickly built the farm making sure to place all the minecarts before they became inaccessible. Since this farm needs a furnace, I also went ahead and set up a carpet duper to fuel said furnace. Even with that being finished, this farm still won't run as it requires bone meal. I'll be addressing that later on. Now that's 8 dies dealt with. 
So far I've addressed 8 out of the 16 dyes needed for this project. Next up, let's work on the brown dye. Farming brown dye in large amounts is very simple, you just need cocoa beans. I should have plenty of these in the jungle near my villager area. I could just fly around here harvesting all the cocoa beans I'd ever need, but let's build a farm for them instead. If you want a quick farm design, all you need to do is place a pillar of logs like this then cover them in cocoa beans. You could then wait for them to grow, or you could use bone meal. You could also use pistons to harvest them all at once. The only issue is this system is a bit slow for my needs, so let's build a proper farm instead. I went ahead and started to collect all the resources needed for this farm. This is going to be the smallest farm I've done so far. For this farm to work, I'd also need bone meal, but I'll be done with that later. Now, let's return to the flower forest. Arriving back in the flower forest, I once again made my way underground and have picked out this section next to the sea pickle farm for this build. I immediately got to work by removing a bunch of these blocks, leaving me with the room needed to start building this thing. With that out of the way, let me fill my inventory with the materials I just gathered, and now we can build this farm. Since this farm was incredibly small, building it only took a few minutes, and with that farm being complete, I could technically start using it. All I'd have to do is flick this lever which would activate some redstone, then start placing some cocoa beans, but all of that requires bone meal, so let's address that. Many different farms in this area will require bone meal, so I need to build a fairly large bone meal farm. Plus this will also allow me to build up a supply of bone blocks so they can be really good for building. I already have a farm design in mind for this. I've used bone meal farms a few times in this world so far. Most recently I built one within my ocean monument transformation. These shulkers contain all the resources needed to build that farm. So let's return to the flower forest. I think I'm going to place this bone meal farm behind the sea pickle farm we built earlier. This farm will be the largest one I've done so far in this area, so I'll need to clear a lot of space. I got to work clearing the room needed for this farm. It took quite a while due to the sheer size of the thing. It was that big that I had to move my beacon a few times. The amount of space I've ended up with here is insane. I gave myself a bit of extra room just in the off chance that I wanted to add some extra stuff. Now, let's get this bone mill farm built. Building this farm is a straightforward process. I went layer by layer, carefully placing each block. One simple mistake will break this farm, so I made sure not to make any. Since I've built this before, the whole building process was faster than normal. After finishing the build, I filled each dispenser with some bone meal to speed up the startup time of this farm. Then, I gave it a quick test. As you can see, bone meal is being made, but it currently has nowhere to go, so I've went ahead and built a simple storage system. This farm will produce 15,000 bone meal per hour, so I ended up doing three storage slices. In the back I've built a shulker loader, meaning that I can store millions of bone meal here. Plus, it will allow me to easily move bone meal when I need to. Now all I need to do is let this farm run while I work in the area. So far I've built the farms to produce 10 out of the 16 dyes needed for the wool farm. Next up, I'd like to work towards the black dye. For this I have two options. I could build a squid farm, or build a wither rose farm. Since squid farms are kind of bad, I'm going to build a wither rose farm. The main part of this farm will be the wither, so I'll need to go and collect three wither skulls. I don't have a dedicated farm for this yet, so I'll need to go into the nether and go to the nearest nether fortress to kill a bunch of wither skeletons. These three skulls are only a small part of the farm. I also need all of these resources. I'm going to be building this farm in the end, making use of the central end portal. But before I start building it, I'm going out to the outer end real quick to collect a few stacks of end stone. I'll be using this to cover the farm. So now, with all of that collected, let's build this farm. This weather rose farm was designed by ANX04. It's very simple and quick to set up. I managed to get all of this built in only 5 minutes. To start using this farm, I first need to spawn the weather. After that, I need to come over here and start placing snow blocks. A pumpkin will then be dispensed, turning this into a snow golem. That snow golem will then be killed by the weather, creating a wither rose. The good thing about this farm is I keep all the pumpkins, and when the snow golems die, they drop enough snowballs to make more golems. One thing I am going to do is expand the storage for shields. That way I won't need to refill it as often. With this farm being finished, I'm going to use it for 20 minutes so that I have enough wither roses for the wool farm. That should be plenty of wither roses. I'm just going to leave that wither there for now. Killing it wouldn't be worth it. So, I won't be building any more farms for the other dyes I need, as I can craft the rest of them from the dyes I've farmed so far, meaning that the dye collection phase is complete. So real quick before I move on to the final part of this project, I'd like to ask if you could subscribe. I'm doing a challenge right now where each subscriber I get means I have to remove 1000 blocks in my hardcore world. Last episode, I got 24 subscribers, so I had to remove 24,000 blocks. If you'd like to add to this, subscribe! So moving on, I think I should get all the farms I've built today running, generating all the dyes needed for the wool farm. First, I need to go around all the flower farms, adding a storage system to each. I'm just going with the basic storage system for now. Then, all I need to do is fill each farm with bone meal, meaning I can turn the farms on. Speaking of storage systems, the wool farm I'm going to build will need a huge one. I want it to be colourful, so I'll use some of the dyes I just collected along with these sheep 
to make up a bunch of different colours of wool. That and all these resources I've collected. Back over in the flower forest, I need to find a place to build this. I'm going to be terraforming this entire area, so I think I'll build this storage system over here, underground. The idea is that this would eventually be on the surface. Now, let's get this built. This storage system is quite simple. All I've done is set up a storage silo for each of the wool colours. These silos have item filters in the back, allowing for only one wool colour per silo. After getting all those in place, I configured the filters and added the last decorative details. Now, you can clearly see where each wool colour will be stored. I also went ahead and added a switch for the wool farm. I'll connect this up to the wool farm once it's built. I also added a door below, which I'll use to access the rest of the farms. On the other end of the hallway, I have another door. This will lead out to the surface later, but for now, it will remain underground. So then what after doing all that prep work, I can finally start building this wool farm. For this, I'm going to be going with the wool farm design I built back at the starter base. But it will be a lot larger. I'll be placing part of this underground, so I'll need to start clearing space for it. I planned all this out prior to recording this episode, now that I think about it, I could have made this smaller. Either way, this farm will suit my needs. After removing a few thousand blocks, the space needed for this farm is ready. Getting this farm up and running is going to take a bit of time. First, I'll need to build the farm using these resources I've gathered. I'll also need a lot of sheep. I'm going with 64 sheep per wool colour, which means I'll need 1024 sheep. Now here's the thing, I've already been working on getting all the sheep. If I go behind this wall, you'll see I already have a bunch of sheep here. I caught some from the flower forest above a while back and brought them down here to start breeding. Now, let's start building this farm. The size of this farm is insane. I've never farmed this many sheep at once before. As I've used this design before, building it was fairly straightforward. When it came to getting the sheep in place, I moved them out of the breeding area one at a time and got them positioned in the farm. Then I dyed them to whatever colour I needed. After getting them all in place for this section, I started building the next. I got faster and faster with each layer. I also had a few YouTube videos playing in the background while working on this, which helped speed this up. After no time at all, the farm was complete. After finishing the farm, I went ahead and connected the farm redstone to the activation circuit in the storage room. That and I placed an item stream, allowing for the wool to be transported to the storage area. Now, before I turn this thing on, I need to go through the entire system filling it with shields. Good thing I have an arm farm. With that done, I could turn this on, producing lots of wool. Now, I've just had a look at the time I have remaining for this project and it's only 10 days, so let's make this area look nice. For this build, I'm making use of some extra materials I had lying around from when I did the ocean monument transformation. I wanted this build to be circular but also blend into the terrain, hence why I'm doing a lot of terraforming. I also wanted it to stand out, hence why I'm using lots of bright colours. And with the last day coming to an end, I finished this insane project. So farming geodes gives you access to all these blocks, but I haven't bought a farm for it yet. So let's build an insane geode factory. For this to work, I'm going to need to find a geode. If my memory is correct, I should have one down in my mines. I last used this to farm amethysts, which I then used in a spyglass over a year ago. Ah, here it is. I could just AFK and harvest it manually, but that's a bit boring, so let's build a farm. This geode won't work for my needs, as I don't want to build a farm in this area. I have another geode over at the wool farm, but it won't work either. So how do you find the perfect geode? It's simple, you use an external tool. Now, I could have just used chunk base for this, as it shows you where each geode is in the world. This is all the geodes that spawn in my world. For what I have planned, this won't work. I'm going to be using the Geode AFK Spot Finder tool by Russell Sprouts. This searches through your world looking for the perfect spot to AFK with as many geodes in range as possible. If I go to these coordinates, I will have 790 budding amethysts within range of my AFK spot. Now, I just need to get out there. Looks like we have an ocean at these coordinates. Hopefully this doesn't slow me down. So I'm going to use this stone pillar to mark out where the AFK spot will be. I'll be doing a large build here later. Plus, this will also allow me to set up a ladder so that I can get under the ocean to access the geodes. After digging around for a bit, I found my first geode in the area. I'm going to place a few torches stopping any hostile mobs from spawning. Then I'm placing this sign. I'm going to give each geode I find a number. This is because each geode is unique, meaning that I have to build a custom farm for each of them. To simplify this, I'm numbering each geode then I'm copying it into a creative world. That way I can easily design the farms. With this first geode being found, let's locate the rest. I went ahead and dug a tunnel out to all the other geodes. I lit them up and gave each of them a number. After doing all of that, I've ended up with all these geodes in my creative world. I've ended up with 16 geodes, each having a unique layout. Now, let's plan out the farms for each of these. I'm going to start with the first one here. I'm going to remove all the useless blocks, leaving only the budding amethyst blocks. These are the most important blocks in the farm, so I'll try to avoid breaking them. Designing farms for geodes can become quite tricky and hard to comprehend, so I'd recommend using the Geodesi mod. 
This will allow you to quickly design farms rather than having to spend several hours working out the quirks for each one. That and it's super cool. A while back, El Mango did a video tutorial covering this mod. I'd recommend giving that a watch after this video if you plan on using it. After using that mod and working through all the steps provided on GitHub, I've ended up with this farm. The general idea is that these flying machines will activate periodically harvesting the amethyst within the farm. You'll probably want to connect this up to either a daylight sensor or a redstone clock of some sort. When the amethysts break, they'll fall into the water below, allowing for new amethysts to grow on the budding amethyst blocks. These amethysts will then be collected in a water stream where they can then be sent to a storage system. We'll be building a big storage system later on. For farms like this, I'd probably recommend using a shocker box storage system of some sort. We've also went ahead and designed the farm for the other geodes I'll be using, so let's head back into the hardcore world to start work on these farms. Before I start working these farms, I'm going to set up an other portal so that travel between here and the rest of the world is faster. After getting the overall portal set up, I jumped into the nether to disable the portal in there. Then, I moved it up to the nether roof. With that being done, let's start working these farms. The first thing I need to do is gather resources. This project will require lots of different things, mainly slime and honey blocks. First, I'm going to focus on the slime blocks. A while back, I knew I'd need a lot of slime blocks for future projects, so I built this farm and have lots of slime blocks here in storage. I'll grab a few shulkers. When it comes to honey blocks, I did the same thing. I built this honey farm in the nether a while back and I've had it running in the background since it can be junk loaded. I'll take a few shulkers from here as well. So that's both the slime and honey blocks collected. I've also went ahead and collected a few other things including the pistons and observers. I may have to craft more of these later. The only thing left I need is moss blocks. Lots of them. For the moss blocks, I'm going over to my ocean monument transformation as I have a bone mill farm there. I'm going to modify it so that it gives me moss blocks. After using this farm for a while, I've got all the moss blocks I need meaning all the resources have been collected. Arriving back at the project area, the first thing I'm going to do is set up a beacon. I'm going to be doing this right at the bottom of the world so that I don't need to move the beacon as often. With that being done, let's start working on the first geode. Geode number one will be my target. My first order of business is to remove all the blocks around it, giving me the room to build all the flying machines. I'm doing this stage very carefully so that I don't break any of the budding amethyst blocks. This is actually a lot of space. I've made sure to light this up as I don't want mobs spawning inside the farm. Next up, I'm getting these flying machines built. These flying machines are simple designs, so building them took no time at all. I got them built on all three sides. For farms like this, I use a Lightmatica mod since these farms can be quite complex. This mod allows you to have a blueprint in the world to work from, which speeds things up by a lot. Technically, this farm will now work, but the drops will go everywhere. To stop that from happening, I'm building an item collection system at the bottom, then I'm covering the whole thing in moss blocks. I've also went ahead and placed some of the activation system in the form of these redstone lanes. You also may have noticed that I never placed the redstone clock. This is because I'll be building one at the AFK spot later on. And with that out of the way, geode farm number one is complete. Let's move on to the next one. Before I move on to the next geode, I'm going into the nether so that I can use the gold farm to repair my gear. Let's just say I'll have to use this a lot for the rest of this project. So the second geode I'd like to build a farm for is a bit different to the one I just completed. This geode is far smaller, meaning that it should be faster to build. There's also quite a bit of water on top which will get in the way. This should be easy enough to deal with. I'll simply wall off part of it and use sponges. With that out of the way, let's start working on this farm. For this one, I'm changing the way I go about starting this by first digging out the borders of the farm. I'm also not clearing out the space that I won't have anything in as it just wastes time. When it comes to building the farm, it's fairly straightforward. I simply go layer by layer double checking everything as I go. I'm also lighting this thing up as having a creeper blow up here wouldn't be ideal. Now, Geode Farm 2 is complete. I'll be connecting this farm to the activation system later on. If I go down this tunnel, I'll end up at Geode 3. This one is a similar size to the first one. Once again, there's quite a bit of water in the area so I dealt with that first. Sponges were very useful here. Now, I can build this farm. Mining this one out was surprisingly quick. It must be my new mining method. After I mined out the initial border, I removed all the amethyst blocks within the geode, allowing for the budding amethyst to be free to minimise the risk of breaking them. After that, I quickly started building the remainder of the farm, getting it all finished super quick. I am kind of tempted to activate the farms I've built so far since they're all fully grown, but I won't. It just means that the first harvest I do when everything is finished will be huge. Anyway, that's Geode Farm 3 complete. Geode 4, which is just down this ladder, is the first one that doesn't have any water or open caves connected to it. Let's build this one quick. With this geode not having any obstructions, I had the whole thing finished in only 30 minutes. I suppose the YouTube playlist I was watching helped speed this up. With that done, Geode Farm 4 is complete. So for the rest of the geodes I have in this area, I need to do things a bit different. Some of them are close together which could cause problems. If they're too close, I'll only be able to farm one of them. Here is an example of two geodes that might be a problem. 
Since I've already designed a farm for both of these, I'm going to load up the farm schematic using Lightmatica to see if there will be any issues. Looks like these farms overlap, meaning that only one of them can be built. I'll be building the farm for the larder's yield. What I'll do is I'll try to keep the other yield untouched as every so often I'll need to silk touch the amethyst, so I'll use this yield for that. Since that'll be the case, I'm still going to clear out a small room around it. That way, all the amethysts can grow. With that out of the way, Geode Farm 5 is complete. I have another geode relatively close by. It's one of those larger ones. Looking at the schematic, this should just about fit. When I was building this one, I quickly discovered that it was closer to the other geode than I thought. This farm overlaps the previous one by one block. What I'm going to do to save me a bit of time is I'm going to make a few minor changes to the previous farm, that way this one will still work. After finishing that farm, I did a quick geode count and it turns out that I'm about halfway through the geodes in this area. I have two other geodes down here which I'm quickly going to build farms for each of them, taking me to the halfway mark. After getting all of that done, I went ahead and built the remains of the geode farms in this area. Since they're all virtually identical, apart from the amethyst bud placement and the flying machines, I built them all off camera. There were a few geodes here and there that I didn't use since they were close together, meaning that the farm couldn't be built. I may come back to this area in the future to build a few smaller versions of these farms. Now, I'd like to start finishing this project. First, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time going around lighting up all of these caves. I typically play with full bray on as it makes the video easier to watch on YouTube. That means that sometimes I forget to light things up. I actually ended up turning hostile mob rendering off during the time lapses due to that mistake. With that done, this entire area should now be mob free. There may be one or two hostile mobs still in the area, but that doesn't matter. I did all of this to slightly reduce the lag of this place. Moving on, I need to connect all these farms together. Currently, they're all independent, meaning that they won't function as one. Let's change that. First, I need an activation system. For this, I'll be using a hopper clock. Back when I was designing these farms, I ended up with this hopper clock which will run every 3 hours, which is the perfect amount of time to let the amethyst grow. Building one for every farm doesn't make sense, so I'll just build one of them and then I'll connect it to the rest using redstone. I plan on doing a large build above the water soon, so I'll build the hopper clock up here. I got this clock built super quick and I also built an area where I will stand while using this farm. Now, all I need to do is fill the clock with the items, meaning that it's good to go. Now. All I need to do is connect it to the farms below. Connecting the farms is a simple process. I simply need to dig a few tunnels, then run a redstone line between them. Due to the sheer size of this place, this took quite a while. Connecting these redstone lines to the clock above will be a bit tricky. To do this right, I'll wall off a small section of the ocean, then I'll drain it using sponges. Then I'll run a redstone line from this clock down to the farms. I'll build a staircase along the walls I just built, then I'll run the redstone lines on top of them. With that out of the way, all the farms are connected, meaning they'll function as one farm. Currently, if I activate these farms, all the amethysts harvested will be destroyed since I don't have a collection system. Let's build one so that I can test this entire thing. First, I'm going to build a few shulker loaders up here close to the redstone clock. I've used this shulker loader design several times in the world so far. It's simple and easy to use. Now I need to work on storing these shulkers once they're full of amethysts. I think I'm going to have this storage room connected to my AFK spot. This storage room is nothing special. It is a simple wall of chests that will be able to support me using this farm for thousands of days at a time. I'll never actually use it for that long. I also did some quick decoration using some blocks I had left over from the Ocean Monument interior, giving me this cosy storage room. Now, let's focus on getting these items up here. Since I've already built the shulker loaders, I simply need to dig my way underground. This will be the water elevator, so I'll place some soul sand right at the bottom and I'll use some kelp to make sure this is all source blocks. I then made sure everything was connected properly up top since I don't want these amethysts going everywhere. Then, all I need to do is go to each individual farm, dig below it and dig many tunnels that will contain water streams. I'll connect these water streams to the elevator, meaning this entire system is ready to go. To test this, I'm going back up to the redstone clock and I'll place a redstone torch which will activate all the farms. After a little while, items should start appearing in these shulkers. So, I'll AFK here until all the farms have run. After a while, all the farms have activated, leaving me with all these amethysts, meaning that this massive amethyst farm is complete. Now, before we move on to finishing this entire project, I need you to stop right there and hit that subscribe button. I'm currently on the road to reaching 100,000 subscribers, and so far, I'm only 7% of the way there. At the end of this year, I'm going to be removing 1,000 blocks for each subscriber I get, so if you want to watch me suffer, subscribe. 
Speaking of suffering, let's finish this entire project by building something here on the surface of the ocean. The build I have in mind for this area will contain thousands of blocks, so I've went ahead and gathered all these shulkers full of materials. I'm going to end up using a lot of amethysts I just harvested in this build, so I'll be taking a few shulkers of amethysts from the storage system. So with all of that out of the way, let's finish this build. So this build was an interesting one. As always, I started by building the terrain the build would sit on. To save him time, I decided to have this island floating in the ocean. It looks a bit strange right now, but that doesn't matter. I'm going to connect this to the ocean floor at a later date. Since this is for an amethyst farm, I wanted to integrate amethyst into the surface build. So, I decided that I wanted to build several custom geodes around the island. To make these visually interesting, I bought a lava pool at the bottom of the geode. This should help the geode stand out in the end. Then, I bought up the walls of the geode along with adding in bits of the final structure of this build. After getting the first of these custom geodes finished, I built three more, then made sure all the terrain I built so far had been connected. Then, after finalising that section, it came to the main build. For this build, I wanted something quick and simple, so I settled on building yet another pyramid. I based this design on Chichen Itza, but I put my own spin on it. For this, I focused on using blocks with a similar texture, mainly stone, stone bricks and cracked stone bricks. For a splash of colour, I added several grass platforms, and I also used anvils to build barriers which provided an extra level of detail. On each side, I built a staircase which would later allow access to the storage room below. At the top, I started working on the entrance. I ended up building a nether portal since I removed the one I was using earlier. Having this fully integrated into the build helped finish this off. Then, I added the final touches to the roof of this build by placing one last grass platform. With all of that being done, i finished yet another project in this hardcore world. Shulker boxes are an essential part of my hardcore world. I use thousands of them, but that isn't anywhere near enough. Soon, I plan on building an insane storage system that will require tens of thousands of shulker boxes. This shulker farm I have right now won't be enough. So let's build a shulker factory. But how do I do that? Well, according to the Minecraft wiki, I can spawn new shulkers by hitting them with a shulker bullet when they're below half health. This isn't as complicated as it looks. I went onto YouTube and found this shulker farm designed by Cubic Meter, which will make 56,000 shells per hour. Let's build it. First, I need a plan. For this to work, I'll need to move a shulker from the outer end to what remains of my central end island, where it can then be teleported to the overworld. I'll then need to find the perfect area for this farm, then move that shulker over there. Once that's done, I can build the farm, install the shulker, and get the whole thing running. Fortunately, I've already done a few of these steps. If I go to spawn, you'll see that I have a shulker here waiting for me. I've had this guy here for about a year. And if I go over to this farm, I have a shulker in here as well. I'll remove this shulker from the farm, and I'll send it back over to spawn. Then, I'll place a bunch of TNT to remove it. After clearing that up, I also went and destroyed my other old shulker farm. With that done, I can mark the first few steps of my plan as being complete. Also, if I end up killing these two shulkers, I have a bunch of extra ones over in my mob switch. Now, let's work on building this farm. For this to happen, I need to find the perfect area. I'm looking for somewhere that's relatively flat. Something like this should work great. So to build this farm, I'm going to remove all this terrain so that it causes less lag. But how do I do that? I could do it all by hand, but that would take a while, so let's use a redstone machine. I've done a project like this before, back when I made this massive hole in the world. When I did that, I used a machine known as a world eater which removes the terrain layer by layer. Well, this works great, I won't be using that today. Since I want this done fast, I'll be using the 3D TNT Quarry by Rezworks. I've used this machine once before when I was removing my end island. I should also mention that this machine isn't technically a quarry, it's a TNT duper that can move in three directions. A quarry is a completely different machine that I'll be building in a future video. With that short explainer out of the way, here's all the resources I need for this machine. All I really need to do is AFK my slime farm for a bit to get all the slime blocks since I've already got everything else from other projects I've done in the world. Now that machine looked small so why do I need so many resources? Well to speed things up, I'll be building several of these and we'll have them running at the same time. Before I build these machines, I need to clear trenches around this area. This is so that I can deal with all the liquids and other things before building these machines. Here's the resources required for this trenching machine. These machines are very simple and easy to use. I've used them many times before and would highly recommend them. Now if you're going to build this duper, you can't place the minecart straight away on this, as the TNT will activate and will have to be replaced. So, how do you prime it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what to do. I had two blocks in the side of the duples, placing an activator rail and a piston. I then add a minecart and power the piston with a redstone block. Then, I remove what I just placed and the TNT duper is ready to go. This is a quick way to prime most TNT duples, so keep that in mind. 
So, after getting those built, I placed some obsidian at the far end so that the machines can bounce back. With all of that out of the way, let's get this started. I'll be doing this by flicking this lever, then pressing this button, and the trench machine is away. The process of digging these trenches is fairly straightforward. I follow the machines as they go back and forth removing the terrain. I go in and remove the liquids and any extra blocks as they appear, meaning I can get down to the bottom of the world much faster. Depending on the height of the terrain, you may have to do this several times before reaching bedrock. With the first trench being done, I need to do this three more times. With those trenches being finished, I can build all of these 3D TNT duppers and the return stations on the opposite side. Every time these machines are activated, they'll move forward dropping TNT, and both the starting and return stations will move as well. So I'm going to activate all three of these machines, then I'll go and sit up here in safety while the terrain is being removed. Just a quick reminder that at the end of the year I will be removing 1000 blocks in my hardcore world for each subscriber the channel has. If you enjoy watching my videos, please subscribe and claim your 1000 blocks. So with this perimeter being finished, I can go ahead and remove these machines for the final time, meaning that I can now focus on building the shulker farm. Before I do that, let's bring the shulker over here. To do this, I have three options. I could build a reel from spawn all the way over here, I could send the shulker into the nether and move it that way, or I could go for the fun third option. Flying machines. With flying machines, all I need to do is build it and let it fly. For this, I'm going to modify the trenching machine I used earlier by removing the TNT and any extra blocks, and I'll use this to move the shulker. Now I just need to build it over its spawn high up in the sky so that no terrain gets in the way. While I'm at it, I'll build a staircase up to the sky with a rail line, and once the shulker is up there, I'll move it onto the flying machine, meaning that all I need to do is activate it, and the flying machine is away. I'll see you over at the perimeter. After a while, this flying machine has almost arrived at the perimeter. I've went ahead and built this obsidian line which should stop the flying machine. Perfect. Now, I'll move this shulker off of the flying machine, and I'll build a temporary platform to keep the shulker and all the resources required for this project. With that done, the shulker moving phase is complete. So building this farm will be a tad bit complicated, so let's go into a testing world to figure some stuff out. So the original design would make 56,000 shells per hour. I don't need anywhere near that amount. How does 10,000 shells per hour sound? I scaled this farm down, ending up with something around this size, which fits my needs a lot better. Even with it being smaller, I still need an insane amount of materials. Most of the materials are easy enough to get, which is why these shulkers are already full of things I've crafted. I'm still missing obsidian and large amounts of glass. For the obsidian, I can go into the end and go to my enderman farm where I can steal some from those chests. I'm almost out of this stuff, so I'll build an obsidian farm real soon. When it comes to the glass, all I need to do is go to the obsidian platform and take some sand that I duped when I built the gravity block duper. I'll take this and make a quick pit stop at the ocean monument transformation to use my furnace array. I'll lay FK here until all my glass has been smelted. With all of that collected, that's the main materials gathered. However, this farm will require a lot of snow golems, so I'll need large amounts of snow blocks and carved pumpkins. Snow is easy enough to collect. All I need to do is ball the box out of iron bars and spawn a snow golem inside. Then I can dig the snow the golem generates, giving me infinite snow. After doing that for a bit, I set up a temporary pumpkin patch and waited until I had all the pumpkins I needed. Then all I had to do was place the pumpkins in a row, carve all of them, then break them, giving me everything I need to start building this farm. I went back over to the perimeter and placed down all my shulker boxes of materials on the start platform. With everything ready to go, let's build this farm.
After finishing the chocolate farm, I realised that I had made a huge mistake. This farm makes use of snow golems. One thing about snow golems is that they melt in warm biomes. One of those biomes being a savanna. Yeah, we built this farm right in the middle of one of those. So yeah, I freaked out for a little bit and thought this whole project was doomed. I spent a whole bunch of time looking up ways to avoid the snow golems melting and didn't really find much. I found an old reddit post that said all I had to do was cover the snow golems with blocks and they should be fine. I even tested this within the perimeter and it worked. The only reason it worked was because I tested it in the part of the perimeter that was in the plains biome. So another mistake there on my part. Then I realised that if I could give the snow golems the regeneration effect, it would allow them to survive for longer in warm biomes and that I wouldn't have to scrap this entire video. I experimented with this idea by using potions but they weren't good enough, so I went ahead and created a data pack that would give snow golems the regeneration effect constantly, meaning they wouldn't lose any health. So crisis averted. Before I start using this farm, I should probably explain how this whole thing works. When I flick this lever, it will send a signal over here to this small shulker farm. Yeah, this mega shulker farm requires a smaller one to start up. Crazy right? Anyway, once this is activated, it will spawn shulkers and they will be moved down to this holding cell. These shulkers will then be taken from here in minecarts and distributed throughout the farm. Then, when the shulkers eventually die, a signal will be sent back and in the process, sending a replacement shulker. So it sounds simple enough. However, I can't turn it on right now as I haven't built the nether side of this farm. I'm going to be killing all the shulkers here in the nether, so the system on this side will be quite complex. Before I start building, I'm going to need to gather all the required blocks. I already have almost everything apart from the ancient debris. I'm going to need quite a bit of it as the ancient debris will be used in the shulker killing system. So I guess I'm going to spend a few hours in the nether mining for ancient debris. After a lot of tedious mining here in the nether, I have all the ancient debris required for this project. So, I'll throw it into this shulker, gather everything I need, and I'll arrive at this spot to start building the nether side of this shulker farm. Wasting no time at all, I started to quickly build this part of the farm. I had to take extra care when it came to the placement of this, as I'm using a lot of nether portals for chunk loading and other things. So if those are off by even one block, the farm could break. Fortunately, I planned ahead for this. So this whole system is quite complicated. First, we have the storage system down here that uses a shulker loader. I figured it would be worth it since this system will produce a lot of shells and it will be loaded a lot. Moving up, we have the area here where the shulkers will arrive. They'll move from the portals to these ancient debris blocks where they will then die from a TNT explosion. The way this system works is I'll place the TNT up here in this AFK chamber and it will be pushed along by a block conveyor where it will then be ignited by a flame arrow that was shot by this piglin. Setting this up was hard because I needed the piglin to shoot an arrow at me in a certain way so that I could push it by a bunch of pistons and into this spot where it will be kept forever. I then had to let that piglin continue to shoot at me until the crossbow broke, where I then dropped the sob of these enchantments, meaning that the piglin could pick it up and I would get the looting effect without generating a large amount of XP. This is going to be fun to start using. With all of that out of the way, I can say that the farm building phase is complete. Now let's work towards getting this farm working. First, I need to install this shulker. All I technically need to do for this is build a rail line from this dark platform all the way down to the small shulker farm. Once this rail line is built, I can push the shulker out of the holding cell and then send it on its way with a furnace minecart. After some time, it has arrived at the shulker farm, meaning I can remove this temporary rail line. There we go. With that done, the shulker installation phase is complete. Now, I need to spend a whole lot of time going over every inch of this farm checking for any mistakes I've made. While I'm doing that, I'm going to fill all the chests with minecarts since this will be used an insane amount of them. After double checking everything, I think I'm ready to start using this farm. First, I'm going to need a lot of TNT. Each TNT requires 4 sand and 5 gunpowder. Sand is easy enough to get since I have a sand duper. I'll take a few shulkers of sand from there. For the gunpowder, I'll make a quick pit stop at the raid farm and I'll take a few shulkers from there as well. With that TNT crafted, let's start using this farm. I'm going to start here in the AFK chamber. First, I'm going to flick this lever to start the chunk loading system. I'll then go into the overworld and I'll flick this lever turning the farm on. Then I return to the nether, stand in this corner and start placing TNT. I'll do this for a while and we'll see how many shulkers I get. After finishing my AFK session, I stop placing TNT and I'm going back to the overworld to turn the farm off. Then I'm returning to the nether to continue placing TNT until shulkers stop coming through the portals below. Now I can stop placing TNT and I can turn off the chunk loading grid, meaning that the farm running phase is complete. With that done, I can go down to the storage and see all all these shulkers full of shells. This farm is amazing. I use a lot of iron in my hardcore world due to all the massive farms I build, but here's the thing. 
I only have this small arm farm and since I plan on building an insane storage system real soon, that arm farm won't be good enough. So let's build an insane iron factory. But how do I do that? In Minecraft, there are two ways to get iron. You could go mining and collect the raw ore, or you could kill a lot of iron golems. Now normally you'd have to summon these yourself using four iron blocks and a carved pumpkin, but there's another way. When villagers are scared by a hostile mob such as a zombie or a pillager, they will summon an iron golem to protect them. We can exploit that by building an iron golem farm. This is simpler than it sounds. I have a lot of experience when it comes to iron farming as I've worked on many different iron farm designs, but this iron farm design by MD piqued my interest as it's very compact and will make 11,000 iron per hour. Let's build it. First, I need a plan. For this to work, I'll need to find the perfect area that will have flat terrain with either a village or a pillager outpost nearby. I'll then destroy the terrain, taking it all the way down to bedrock, where I can then start building the farm. Afterwards, I'll build a massive villager build to fill the iron farm with villagers, and I'll use the pillager outpost to get an army of pillagers. Once all of that's done, I can start using the farm. So, let's get started. Since I'm going to be building a new iron farm, I think it's finally time to retire this old one. All I'm going to do is kill the villagers in the farm and the pillager in the middle. Then I can move the entire thing. I'm going to leave the storage system for now as it's completely full of iron. Now, let's work on building this farm. For this to happen, I need to find the perfect area. Since I need this to be close to both a village and a pillager outpost, I'm going over to the pillager outpost I used to get Bad Omen and I'll start flying over in this direction. There's a large continent over here that should have the flat terrain I need. This spot should work great. So since I want to build this farm low down in the world at Bedrock, I'll need to remove all this terrain using flying machines. I've done this several times in the world so far so I know exactly what I need to do. To remove all this terrain fast, I'll use a 3D TNT quarry by Razeworks. I've used this machine before when I was removing my end island and also when I was clearing the terrain from my shulker farm. I should also mention that this machine isn't technically a quarry, it's a TNT duper that can move in three directions. A quarry is a completely different machine that I'll be building in a future video. Since I used this machine last episode, I already have all the resources required to build it. Before I build this machine, I need to clear the trenches for this area. This is so that I can deal with all the liquids and extra blocks, and so that I have the space in the hole for the machines when I need to rebuild them lower in the world. Here's the resources required for this trenching machine. These machines are very simple and easy to use. I've used them many times before and would highly recommend them. Now if you're going to build this duper, you can't place the minecarts straight away on this, as the TNT will activate and will have to be replaced. So, how do you prime it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what to do. I add two blocks on the side of the duples, placing an activator rail and a piston. I then add a minecart and power the piston with a redstone block. Then, I remove what I just placed and the TNT duper is ready to go. This is a quick way to prime most TNT duples, so keep that in mind. So after getting those built, I place some obsidian at the far end so that the machines can bounce back. To start them, all I need to do is flick this lever, then press this button, and the trenching machine is away. While this machine runs, I follow it and remove any extra blocks and liquids that could cause the machine to break. This machine is quite fast so I need to be careful as I don't want to be blown up. Since I'm actively removing liquids and other blocks, I can get down to the bottom of the world much faster since I don't need to stop and start the machine as often. Depending on the height of the terrain, you may have to build these several times to reach bedrock. With that first trench being done, I'm going to remove the machine and the obsidian so that I can do all of this three more times. With those trenches being finished, I can build all of these 3D TNT duplers and the return stations on the opposite side. Every time these machines are activated, they will move forward dropping TNT and both the starting and return stations will move as well. So I'm going to activate all four of them, then I'll go and sit up here in safety while this terrain is being removed. Just a quick reminder that at the end of the year I will be removing 1000 blocks in my hardcore world for each subscriber the channel has. If you enjoy watching my videos, please subscribe and claim your 1000 blocks. So with all that terrain removal being finished, the first few steps of my plan are complete. Now I'm going to tidy this place up by removing these flying machines for the final time and then I'll remove any floating blocks that are left. There we go. Now I can focus on building the farm. First I'm going into a testing world as I'd like to make a few changes to the design. 
so the original design would make 11,000 iron per hour, but I'd like a lot more, so rather than building one of these farms, I'll be building six, making 66,000 iron per hour. This does mean that the resource list for this will be huge. Fortunately, a lot of these materials are easy to get, which is why I already have a barrel here full of shulkers containing some of the items needed for this farm. There are several items which are a bit harder to get. These are slime blocks, smooth stone, oak leaves and white stained glass. For the slime blocks, I'm going to AFK my slime farm and after a quick crafting session, I have all the slime blocks I need. For the oak leaves, all I'm doing is growing a bunch of trees, then making use of some shields to harvest all the leaves I need. When it comes to the smooth stone, I'm going to take a few shockers of cobblestone from the cobble farm and I'll take this over to my ocean monument to use my furnace array. I'll send this through the system twice to make the smooth stone. Then, last of all, I have the white stained glass. For this, I'm going into the end and I'll take some sand from the sand duper storage system and I'll take this over to the ocean monument to turn it into glass using the furnace array. Then I'll make a stop at my sheep and dye farm to turn it all into white stained glass. Then, all I need to do is take all these items over to the perimeter where I've set up a temporary storage area. With all of the item collection out of the way, let's build this farm. So unlike normal iron farms, these ones are quite complicated due to how compact they are. This means that the average build time for each farm is longer than average, which is why this time lapse is as long. After what felt like an eternity, I finally finished building this iron farm. With that done, the farm building phase is complete. Next, let's focus on filling this thing with villagers. To do that, I'll be building a villager breeding. Villager breeding is actually really simple. All we need is two villagers, three or four beds and drop them some food and then after a short amount of time you'll have more villagers. I made a tutorial on a super simple villager breeder three years ago that should work for this but I'd have to actively feed the villagers which is kind of slow so I'll be building a fully automatic one by Roma GFX. I've put together a few shulkers of materials and I'll use this area close to the village near the iron farm for this breeder. I'm going to be building a tower of these things so that I don't have to wait as long to get all the villagers I need for this iron farm. I was able to build this fast since the design is simple and easy to build. Then, all I had to do was capture a few villagers from the village, then send them into the breeder. After a bit of standing around, this holding cell is full of villagers, meaning that I can start filling the farm. To fill this thing, I brought a temporary rail line from the breeder down to the iron farm, and I'll send the villagers along it and into the holding cells. After a few hours, I had all the villagers in place, meaning that the villager breeding phase was complete. Now, let's work towards filling this farm with pillagers. Each module requires two pillagers, meaning I need 16 in total, which means I'll need 16 name tags. You can get these by finding them in dungeons, fishing, or by trading with villagers. I'll be using the villager trading hall I built a long time ago for this. I'll trade with these librarians until I have all the name tags. There we go. Then, all I have to do is rename them in this anvil. Now, let's work towards getting the pillagers. To make this as easy as possible, I'll be using the pillager outpost where I get Bad Omen. Since I have a farm here already, I'll go up to the top and wait for the pillagers to spawn and arrive up here. Normally, I'd kill them, but I won't be doing that this time. Instead, I'm going to be building a real long rail line all the way over to the ham farm. Then, all I need to do is modify this pillager farm a little bit, and then I need to get all these pillagers into minecarts. Then, I'll use this furnace minecart, and I'll meet them over at the perimeter. Once they arrive at the iron farm, I push them towards the holding cells and I get them positioned correctly. Then I remove any temporary blocks. Now I need to do this for the remaining modules. After all those pillagers are in place, I'm going to remove the temporary rail line, meaning that the pillager phase is complete. While moving these pillagers, I realised that earlier I made a slight mistake when calculating the rates of this farm. I thought that this whole thing would make 66,000 iron per hour, but I was wrong. It actually makes 88,000 iron per hour, which is nice. Now, I can technically start using this farm, but there's a problem. Currently all these farms operate independently, meaning I'd have to go and activate each of these one at a time. That isn't ideal, so let's fix that by using redstone. This redstone essentially makes each of these farms operate as if they were one farm, which simplifies the activation system. 
as you can see by these two redstone blocks, I haven't connected all the redstone. This is because these two redstone blocks are for two different systems in the farm. The one on the left is for the pillagers, and the one on the right is for the villagers. Even with that done, the system still isn't usable, so let's work on that. I'm going to take these lines of slime all the way up to the sky, where I'll have the AFK spot and storage. Up here, I'm going to build a small glass platform and I'll connect all the redstone up to these knob blocks. That way, all I need to do is right click on both to activate the farm. You'll notice how many redstone lamps activate. The redstone for this system is quite simple, as you can see here. I never could have done all of this, but I wanted it to look cool, hence why I've used this activation system. I'm also going to build a copy of that activation system because in the future I plan on building a chunk loading grid here so that this is loaded when I'm not in the area. This system won't currently do anything but it just means I won't have to modify this later. Next, let's work on the storage system. Since this farm will produce 88,000 iron per hour, I'm going to need a lot of chests. So I went ahead and built a wall of chests on either side with hoppers feeding into them. Now for most farms a setup like this would be fine but since this farm makes so many items, let's use shulkers. We can do this automatically using shulker loaders which is what I'm building right now. I've left plenty of space so I may build more of these in the future when I expand the farm. Yeah, that's right, I plan on adding a lot more modules to the farm in the future which is why this AFK chamber is so high up. Now, all I need to do is connect the water streams from the farm below to this storage room, then I'll set up an nether port allowing me to get here much faster. I think at this point this farm is finished. I won't start using it right away though as there's still a few things left to do. First. I'm going to spend some time going through the shulker loaders setting up all the item filters. This system would be a waste if it collected all the poppies. After getting that done, I should probably fill this shulker loader with shulker boxes. Good thing I have a huge shulker farm for this. I took some shulker shells from this shulker farm and went and crafted a bunch of shulkers, then I filled this chest. After a while, all those shulker loaders should be completely full of shulkers and I've went ahead and put all the extra shulkers I had in this chest. Before I start using this thing, I should probably check that I built the farm correctly. Since I use Lightmatica to build from schematics, I just need to run around the farm double checking everything and apart from a few missing blocks, everything is ready to go. So, all I need to do is activate both of these node blocks and after the lamps have turned on, this farm is running. I'll stand here for an hour and I'll see how much iron I end up with. With that hour being finished, I'm going to activate both of these knob blocks again, turning the farm off. Now, when I look in these chests, you'll see all these shulkers full of iron, meaning this massive iron farm is working perfectly. 